Billionaire Under the Mistletoe, Billionaire for Christmas, Book One, written by Hannah Jo Abbott, narrated by Emily Christine. Chapter One. Fa la 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 la. Abigail Williams sang into her hairbrush as she stood in front of her mirror. The song playing from the radio came to an end, and she looked into the mirror and spoke to herself. You really should be more serious, she said. Then she laughed as she picked the brush back up and began singing, Rockin' around the Christmas tree. Abby danced her way to the kitchen where she poured herself a cup of coffee. She walked to the window, feeling hopeful. The weatherman had predicted flurries today. She pulled back the curtain and held her breath. She let out that breath in disappointment. No snow, she said. I shouldn't have hoped. Growing up and living in her hometown of Denver, Colorado, she still never grew tired of seeing the snow. She had always felt there was a magic to the season, and that never changed. With her cup of coffee in hand, she sat at the kitchen table. In the one-bedroom apartment, she could see the bedroom and the living room from the kitchen. She pushed a pile of papers out of the way and brushed her long blonde hair over her shoulders as she opened her laptop. She navigated to the job postings page she had been looking at the night before. She would much rather open up the document holding her latest writing project, a romance novel, but she knew she had to put that aside for now. Her stomach growled, reminding her that she hadn't eaten breakfast. She thought about checking the cabinet for something to eat, but knew she would find it empty, like her stomach. She wasn't exactly a starving artist. She just hadn't been to the store this week. And yes, her bank account was running low since she had paid the rent yesterday. Abby thought about her last office job and part of her wish she still had a job for the paycheck. But she had felt like working in a cubicle had drained every creative thought right out of her. She had scrimped and saved for months, waiting until the right time to quit her job and write full time. But she hadn't been ready when the company downsized and she was let go before she could carry out her plan. Now she sighed as she stared at the computer screen, reading over job listings that sounded as bad as her previous employment. She read ten descriptions before slamming the computer shut and leaning back in her chair with her arms across her chest. I won't go back to something that's soul-sucking, she told herself. But what else can I do? She moved the cursor over the file to her story and opened it up before she could tell herself not to. For twenty minutes, she lost herself in the world of her characters, her fingers flying over the keyboard with ease until her stomach growled again. Standing up from the table, she made a decision. I will not go back to a cubicle, she promised herself. I need to write. She sighed again. But I also need to eat and pay the bills. All the things her parents had said came back to whisper in her ear. Honey? You are a talented writer, and I know you love it, but you need to be serious, her dad had said. It's fine to write as a hobby, her mom had said another time, but you need to keep a real job. A real job, Abby said out loud. A job that will take all your time and drain you of all ability to write as a hobby. She shook her head. What would her parents say about her today? Closing the job listings page to write, all while she needed groceries and she didn't know where her next rent payment was coming from? I've got to do something, she told herself. An idea came to her then. Maybe I can get a part-time job so I can pay the bills and still have time to write. Yeah, that's it, she said. She pushed down the negative thoughts in her head, saying, Uh, yeah, that won't work. She wouldn't listen to that today. It could work. She would make it work, if only to keep from having to ask her parents for money. Abby took the few steps to her bedroom closet and picked out an outfit that was warm and casual, but that she also thought would say, hire me. Dressy jeans and a cream-colored sweater was just the thing. She hurried out the door, determined to come home with a job. Stuart Vincent couldn't believe what he was seeing. Please, Joyce, don't do this. Don't go. I'll make it work for you. The woman held up her hand to him. I've made my decision, she said. She went back to her desk and continued packing things into the small box on top. But what will I do? Stuart's mind was racing. 
He paced his six-foot frame back and forth while running his fingers through his short, light brown hair. You'll find someone else. Joyce was in her late fifties, and she wagged her finger at him now. Hopefully someone that you will treat better than me. Don't say that. Stuart's eyes were sad now. I haven't treated you badly, really, have I? Joyce stopped packing things for just a moment. Mr. Vincent, you're not a bad boss in the sense that you're mean or cruel, but you ask a lot of me, and I just can't give you that kind of commitment anymore. But you're really going to leave me now, when we're entering the holiday season? Yes, I am, Joyce said firmly. I want to spend the holidays with my family. I don't want phone calls and texts all day long, and I don't want to watch the snow from my office window this year. I want to go out and walk in the snow. I want to go Christmas shopping with my daughter and make gingerbread houses with my grandchildren. Stuart had been contemplating pulling the box away from her, dumping it on the desk, and chaining her to the chair. Joyce had been his assistant since almost the beginning of the company. Stuart had started One Source Technologies when he graduated from college, but he had been building gadgets and computers for himself since he was in high school. Some people might say they couldn't have dreamed of the success he had found, but Stuart had been planning his business and making goals for as long as he could remember. And once his business became a multi-billion dollar company, he only continued to push to do more and build better. Now he sighed as he spoke to Joyce. All right, I understand, but I will never find another assistant as good as you. Yes, Joyce said. I know. She smiled. You're plenty successful, you'll be just fine, and you'll have people lined up around the block to apply for the job. Stuart put his hands over his eyes. That's what I'm afraid of. He looked at her now. Can't you just work out a two-week notice? He begged. No, I feel a little bad about that, but I knew if I gave you two weeks, you would use those two weeks to convince me to stay, so I'm going. She picked up her box. Goodbye, Mr. Vincent. She stopped and looked him in the eyes. I'm going to live my life. I hope that you will find time to do the same. Stuart watched her go and slowly walked back to his own large office. He sank into the leather armchair and stared at the wall. What in the world am I going to do about an assistant? He wondered to himself, but only for a moment. He would have to take care of that soon, but right now he had a meeting to prepare for and no one to help him do it. Chapter 2 Abby pulled her purse strap up on her shoulder and hoped it would stay there this time. She had parked her car downtown and was walking a row of shops, stopping in each one to ask about applying for a position. It was the holidays, after all, and she was sure that most of them hired seasonal help at the very least. She had filled out an application at a clothing boutique and a bookstore, and she had spoken with the manager at a florist shop. As she approached a coffee shop, she had to make a quick decision whether to order breakfast or inquire about a job. The latter won out, and she walked in with determination. Hi, she greeted the girl at the counter with a big grin. How are you this morning? Fine, replied the girl. What can I get for you? The girl seemed friendly, and Abby hoped this was her moment. I was hoping to speak to the manager. I'm interested in applying for a job. Abby smiled again. Oh, well, I'm not sure we're hiring right now. We're pretty well staffed. But if you would like to fill out an application, we can keep it on file. Abby tried not to let her face show any disappointment, but she couldn't go home without a job. She had to have one today. Thanks. I can work any shifts, and I could start right away, today even. The girl looked her over and sighed just a little. All right, let me go see if I can get them. She turned and walked through the door to the back. Abby took a deep breath and let it out. Her desperation was running high. She drummed her fingers on the counters while she waited. I could work here, she said out loud. She saw a cup on the counter and without thinking she reached up and picked it up. She didn't hear the door open behind her. Hi, I'm Abby. Our specials today are peppermint hot chocolate and Santa sleigh cookies. She smiled at the fake customer in her mind. What can I get for you? I need twenty coffees and a tray of scones. Abby jumped at the deep voice behind her. She squealed and without thinking she turned and threw the empty coffee cup at the man. What in the world? He said. 
Abby's eyes were wide and her mouth dropped open. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you come in. He rubbed his eyebrow where the paper cup had hit him. I thought you were asking me what I wanted. No, I, um, I was just practicing. She stepped back as she took him in. He wore a long coat over his suit and she couldn't help but let her eyes roam over his handsome face and blue eyes. His light brown hair was perfect, despite the coffee cup attack. Well, listen, I'm in a huge hurry. I need 20 coffees and a tray of scones plus, I don't know, like sugar and cream and whatever you would put with a bunch of coffees. Oh, I am, I, I'm, Abby stood frozen, not sure what to say. Please, can you help me? If you get the coffee and deliver them to my office in the next 15 minutes, I'll pay you $100. Really? Abby said, her face showing her shock. Yes, really. My office is just a couple of blocks away. Can you do it? Sure, Abby said. Great, here, this should cover the coffee. He pressed some money into her hand. I'll pay you the hundred when you deliver. Here's the office address, seventh floor. He handed her a card. Thanks, and please hurry. With that, he turned and left. Abby looked at the money and then turned over the card in her hand. Stuart Vincent? She whispered. She continued reading the name of the company. One Source Technologies. And her mouth dropped open as she realized who she had been talking to. Just then, the coffee girl returned from the back. I'm sorry, she said. The manager is busy and said we're fully staffed, like I said, so if you want, I can get you an application. Okay, thanks. I might come back and do it another time, but could I get 20 black coffees to go? And a tray of scones? And, um, something to carry it all in? She gave a pleading smile and hoped the girl didn't think she was crazy. Coffee girl gave her a strange look but said, Sure. Cream and sugars? Yes, yes, please. Plenty of cream and sugars and, um, maybe some napkins, too? Would you like cups and coffee in a box to go? We usually recommend that over actually carrying 20 cups of coffee. Oh, yes, that sounds good. All right, coming right up. It took a few minutes, but when the coffee and scones came out, Abby silently prayed that she would be able to carry it to the office. Coffee girl must have read her mind. I can put it in a box for you to carry. Oh, yes, please, thank you. In the box went two pourable boxes of coffee, a tray of scones, and enough cream, sugar, and napkins for a small army. Abby thanked the girl again and picked up the box. She groaned as she felt the weight of it, but smiled and headed out the door. She prayed every step of the two blocks to the office, through the lobby, and up the elevator to the seventh floor. The elevator doors opened and she heard male voices down the hallway. She followed the sound and turned towards a slightly open door. She pushed it open a little further with her foot and stopped at the sight of the long table with leather rolling chairs and several men in very expensive-looking suits. She glanced around, feeling like a deer in the headlights, and then heard a voice she had heard once before today. Thank you. You can put everything on the table. Stuart Vincent came into view. All right, Abby mumbled. She made it to the table and felt her arms practically give a cry of relief as she set the box down. Would you like it poured in cups or left like this? She asked no one in particular. This is fine, thank you, Stuart answered. Gentlemen, please help yourselves. I'll be right back. Stuart, where is Joyce? An older man at the end of the table spoke with a look of concern on his face. I'll explain later, but Joyce is no longer my assistant. What? Cries from around the room arose. Stuart held up his hands. I'll explain. Excuse me for just a moment. He motioned Abby to go to the door and walked out ahead of her. Abby left everything on the table and followed him. Your money, he said, holding out an envelope to Abby. Thanks, she said. I appreciate you being so prompt. No problem, Abby said. So Joyce was your assistant? Yes, Stuart said, stepping back towards the door. And you fired her? He stopped and looked at her. His eyes narrowed. I did not fire her. She quit, if you must know. Now please excuse me, I have a meeting to attend. Thank you for your help. I'll be happy to pass along to the coffee shop manager that she has an excellent employee. Abby bit her lip. She hadn't lied, but she felt a little guilty letting him think she worked there. Um, well... Have a nice day. Stuart turned and walked into the room, closing the door behind him. Abby crossed her arms and rolled her eyes. Rich guys, 
She turned to go and made her way to the elevator. As she watched the numbers going down to the first floor, an idea began to form in her mind. Could I? Should I? She thought to herself. No. She shook her head as she said the word out loud. She looked up and decided she shouldn't talk to herself since she might be on a security camera, but her thoughts continued. Maybe. The more she thought, the more she talked herself into. When the elevator reached the lobby and opened, she pressed the number seven and watched the doors close again. Stuart felt drained from sitting through the meeting. It was unlike him since he usually felt invigorated by work. But he had explained to his board of directors how his assistant of seven years had walked out. Usually Joyce was beside him in the meetings. She was also the one to get coffee and set up the tables, so it was obvious today when she wasn't there. He didn't know how he was going to make it through the rest of today, much less the busy holiday season. He sighed as the meeting finally came to a close and each of the board members shook his hand and left. Stewart's own father was the last to leave, offering condolences on the loss and telling him he better find someone quick, but someone good. Now alone in the room, he stood ready to head back to his office, but before he could, he realized no one would come to clean up the coffee and straighten the chairs. He considered calling one of his business partners to send an assistant over to take care of it, but changed his mind. He put the lid on the leftover coffee and peeked at the tray of scones to see there was only one left. Only one thing to do, he thought as he picked it up and took a bite. Mr. Vincent? The voice startled him and he felt caught in the act. Yes? He turned, mouthful of scone, to see the girl from the coffee shop. He didn't hide his surprise. But then she had surprised him first thing this morning when she threw a coffee cup at him. He had almost laughed then, and remembering it, he wanted to laugh now. But he swallowed the bite of scone instead and looked at her. What is it? Hi, I'm Abigail Williams, Abby. She reached out to shake his hand. I don't think I introduced myself before. No, I don't think so. Stuart raised his eyebrows, waiting to see what she wanted. What can I do for you, Miss Williams? I couldn't help thinking about how you lost your assistant, and I'm sure you're very busy and finding a new assistant could be time-consuming, so I thought I could help save you the trouble and offer to take on the job myself. Really? Stuart's face was something between a smile and a smirk. You want to offer yourself a job? Abby's smile held steady. I guess you could put it that way, but really I'm doing you a favor— you could spend weeks advertising the position, interviewing, and choosing between candidates, but then you would still be without an assistant all that time, so the way I see it, you would be better off to hire me for the job, and I can start right away. Today, even. You can catch me up to speed, and I could do anything you need. And you think you could handle the job? Sure. I'm good with a computer and with people, and I could help with whatever. But you don't even know what I need an assistant to do, Abby shrugged. I can learn. Stuart furrowed his eyebrows, looking her over. What about the coffee shop? You would just quit there today? I already had an assistant walk out today. I don't need someone who isn't committed to their job. Abby bit her lip. Well, that's something I wanted to tell you. You were mistaken when you came in the coffee shop this morning. I don't work there. I just happened to be at the counter when you came in. What? Stuart raised his voice. You said you were practicing. I was. I was actually trying to get a job there this morning, and I was practicing to talk to the manager. So then you lied to me? No, no, I didn't. Abby held her hand up in the air to emphasize her point. You never asked if I worked there. You just said you needed coffee and said you would pay me to bring coffee to your office. Yes, but I said that because I thought you worked at the coffee shop. I wouldn't have asked a strange woman to deliver coffee to my office out of the blue. Abby shrugged. Well, I don't know that. You asked if I could do it, and I said yes, and I followed through with what you asked, which just goes to show you I would make a great employee. She smiled. Stuart squinted his eyes and fell into the nearest chair. I guess you've got me there. He leaned back and stroked his chin. The position is very time-consuming. I need someone who can be available 24-7. I work all hours, so I need someone who will be available when I'm working. Abby nodded slowly, seeming to take it all in. All right. But there's some flexibility when I'm traveling, and the pay is extremely good. Suddenly, he found himself trying to make the position desirable to her. He wasn't sure why. How good? she asked. 
He named an amount and her jaw dropped open. She closed it again quickly. That sounds reasonable, she said. Stuart couldn't help himself. He laughed out loud at the look on her face. He had been holding in that laugh since the face she made when she realized she had thrown a coffee cup at him. Have you ever used scheduling software? Yes, as a matter of fact, I worked in the scheduling department of a major hospital. I worked with several clinics and doctors' schedules for appointments and procedure scheduling. Hmm, that's good, Stuart said. And I see that you can handle delivering coffee. Are you proficient with email and typing? Yes, I am. And how would you feel about personal errands like ordering lunch and picking up dry cleaning? I have no problem with that. Stuart stared at her again. She was younger than his former assistant, to be sure. He guessed she was a few years younger than him. This might be a terrible mistake, but he could make a terrible mistake after interviewing for weeks, too. He couldn't believe he was even considering this. He told himself it had nothing to do with the adorable dimple every time she smiled and the way she tried to appear confident, but she was nervously twirling a piece of hair without even noticing. And if I run a background check, I won't find a criminal record? Abby laughed now, and it surprised him how much the sound delighted him. Nope, no criminal record here. Thankfully, they don't arrest people for accidentally sort of impersonating a coffee shop employee. Stuart smiled. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll hire you on a trial basis. You're right that it would take me weeks to find someone and we're too busy during the holidays to go through that. So I'll give you until New Year's. And if it's working out, you can stay. And if one or both of us feels like it isn't the right fit, that will be it. Abby's smile lit up the room. Fair enough, she said. She reached out and shook his hand. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. I promise you won't regret this. Stuart stood as she shook his hand with vigor. I hope not. Chapter 3 The next morning, Abby took the elevator to the seventh floor. She had tried her best to look the part of assistant and had pulled out her best work attire. She wore a dark pencil skirt and fitted blazer with peep-toe heels to top it off. She bit her lip to fight back the nerves as she reached the seventh floor and walked into Mr. Vincent's office. When he had agreed to hire her the day before, he had her come back to his office and fill out some paperwork, he really was going to run that background check. She had offered to stay and get started that afternoon, but he told her to come in ready to work first thing in the morning. Good morning, she said as she entered the door and found him at what would be her desk. Morning, he said gruffly. I don't have a lot of time to train you right now, but I've opened up the scheduling software and set you up with email. It's all here on the computer. He motioned to the screen as he stood up from the desk. Abby approached the desk and came around to see the computer. She moved near him to see where he pointed and noticed his cologne. He smelled a little bit like spice and pine trees, and it reminded Abby of a Christmas tree. She cleared her throat and reminded herself she was here to work. So these are your appointments for the day here? She pointed to the screen. Yes, I have them on my computer and my phone, but if anything changes, you need to update it in the calendar and send me a text letting me know. He handed her a phone. This is yours for work. I've programmed your number in my phone already and connected it with the computer so everything will sync. Abby nodded. All right, so what else should I do? Answer phones or anything? No, not really. There are other secretaries for that. Almost no one gets through to my office, and anyone who really needs to speak with me has my number. Mostly just the higher-level leadership and board of directors. I visit the development teams, product teams, and sales departments on a rotating basis. Gotcha. I've routed Joyce's email to your new address, so you will start getting those emails. We can go over that more later. I have an opening in my schedule at 11, so why don't you order lunch, and we can go over more details of the day-to-day -day then. All right, sounds good. There's also this. He opened the bottom desk drawer and pulled out a large three-ring binder and dropped it on the desk with a loud thud. Joyce apparently was kind enough to leave this information to help with the transition, which is great, since she left me on a moment's notice. Start working your way through this, and it should explain at least some of what she did. Abby tried to hide her eyes that were as big as saucers. Perfect, thanks. See you at lunch. Stuart turned and walked through the large wooden door to his own office and shut it. 
Abby let out the breath she didn't know she was holding. She stared at the computer and thought, What have I gotten myself into? I have no idea what I'm doing. She opened the binder and flipped through the first couple of pages. She felt her spirits lift a little when she found Joyce's list of daily activities and instructions for basic tasks. Very kind indeed, Abby thought. She sipped her coffee and spent the next two hours poring over the binder. It was chock full of information and Abby was so grateful. She hadn't known what to expect when she agreed to come work for such a wealthy and powerful man. She remembered the night before when she had Googled him looking for information. There were several articles about how quickly he had grown the business in his 20s and how the company was big on charitable donations. But for Joyce to have put this much work into helping her former boss with a new assistant, then she must have respected him, and that said a lot. Abby kept an eye on the schedule and checked the notes Joyce had left about various people. She followed the directions and sent Mr. Vincent a text ten minutes before each phone call to remind him and give him the info on each person. At 10.30, she checked the back of the binder for the list of restaurants in the area with Mr. Vincent's usual orders and called to place a lunch order to be delivered at 10.55. When the food arrived, she checked that everything was correct and then gathered the bags and carried them to Mr. Vincent's office where she knocked on the door and waited. Come in, he called out. Abby entered and heard him talking on the phone. She waved in greeting and then began setting up the food on his desk, careful not to disturb his computer or his papers. Within a couple of minutes, Mr. Vincent wrapped up the phone call and hung up. He took off the headset and tossed it on the desk and then looked wide-eyed at the food in front of him. Wow, how in the world did you know what to order? How do you think? Abby had laid out her own food on the other side of the desk. She popped a french fry in her mouth and settled back in the chair. Joyce? He asked, yep, that binder is amazing. Unbelievable. You're not kidding. She thought of everything. I'm grateful for it, but it's pretty intimidating. I can see how she's going to be a hard act to follow. Yeah, she is, Stuart said. Then he looked at Abby long and hard. But you have definitely stepped up to the plate, so I'll give you credit for that. Thanks, Abby said around a mouthful of food. It's a good thing. I told you I don't have a lot of time to watch over you, so you need to be a self-starter, and I think you've shown that today. Abby beamed, proud to be getting good feedback in only a few hours. I told you I'm a fast learner, and I'm not afraid to jump in and get my hands dirty. Stuart nodded. Not too dirty, though. I did get your background check back. It looks like you're pretty clean there. Abby shrugged. I told you. So what you're saying is what you tell me is who you are? Yep. With me, what you see is what you get, so if you don't like what you see, just move on. Stuart didn't respond. He looked at her for a few moments before picking up his food and starting to eat. So what did you want to discuss? Abby asked. Stuart waved his hand at her. We'll get to that in a minute, but a rule Joyce might not have mentioned, but that you definitely should know. Don't mess with me while I'm enjoying my favorite meatball sub. Abby laughed and the sound lifted all the way up to the high ceiling of the office. Fair enough. You just let me know when you're ready, boss man. I'm ready when you are. Abby settled back and ate her lunch, but she couldn't help admire the handsome man sitting across from her. He might be a big fancy businessman in an expensive suit, but deep down he was a regular man enjoying his lunch. Stuart heard the door close as Abby left his office. Then he leaned back in his office chair and closed his eyes for just a moment. He couldn't believe how well the morning had gone. Honestly, he had expected to struggle through a couple of months of having Abby as an assistant and go through the hiring process after the first of the year. He hadn't expected her to be so good at the job. Incredibly good, he thought to himself. He smiled when he thought about how she had dropped her shoes in the floor and tucked her feet underneath her in the chair. Joyce never would have done that. Part of him thought he should tell her it was unprofessional, but something else in him found it a little endearing. And besides, it was lunch in his office, his favorite lunch at that, so he decided to overlook it, for now. What he couldn't overlook was how her curly blonde hair bounced when she moved. It hadn't been curly yesterday when they met, so the look surprised him. It made her seem fun and carefree. She was a surprise so far, that much he knew, 
but most importantly, she was handling things which allowed him to do his job, which is what he did now. He opened the computer to look at the third quarter sales figures. He had a meeting with the vice president in charge of sales in just 30 minutes. He made some notes on a pad on his desk with a few final thoughts. He had told Abby to be ready to go to the meeting with him in 15 minutes. He wanted her to meet everyone this week so she could get the lay of the land. He heard himself in his mind practicing, saying, This is my new assistant, Abby. He stopped to wonder if he should say Abby or Abigail. Abigail seemed more professional, but she called herself Abby. Maybe I should ask her how she would like to be introduced, he thought. But a second later, he knew without another thought, I've spent enough time with her to know that without a doubt, she's Abby. Chapter 4 Abby walked back to her office, opening and closing her hand. It was sore and cramping from writing so much during the meeting. Next time I'll take the laptop and type notes, she thought. Plus, she could keep a note open for the story ideas that came to her in the middle of the meetings. Maybe, she thought. She didn't know if that would work, since Mr. Vincent would be able to see her computer screen. Maybe she could sit across from him. When she walked into the meeting today, she hadn't been sure where she should sit. But Mr. Vincent had offered her a chair, so she took it. Then he sat next to her. Right next to me, she thought. She could smell his cologne again, and several times he bumped her arm as he talked or motioned for something. And every time, Abby's heartbeat picked up the pace just a little. Now, back in her office, she opened her computer to type up the notes from the meeting. Before getting to work, she connected to the wireless speakers in the office and turned on some Christmas music. She opened the email and clicked Mr. Vincent's contact info and his picture appeared in a small box. She looked around as if someone might see her before she clicked the box that made the picture open larger on the screen. He was the picture of professionalism in his dark suit, his brown hair cut short and not a bit out of place. But his eyes, a tiny sigh escaped Abby's lips. His eyes were clear blue. In the picture, they were full of confidence and the power of his position. But when he talked, they were bright with possibility. He spoke of the future of the company like a true dreamer, and he should, of course. He had built his own company in his 20s and grown it to the multi-billion dollar empire that it was now. He was someone who could take an idea and run with it. The main office door opened in front of Abby and she closed the image immediately when she saw Mr. Vincent in front of her. Will you send me the notes from the meeting? He asked. Abby pointed at her computer. I'm doing that now, she said. Good. He walked towards his office but stopped in the doorway and turned around, tilting his head to listen. Did you turn this music on? Yes, Abby said without turning around. I love Christmas music, don't you? Hmm. Joyce usually played classical instrumental pieces. Abby turned and smiled at him. Well, I'm not Joyce. Stuart chuckled as a smile broke out on his face. No, you're definitely not. Abby watched him go and could only hope that was a good thing. She finished typing the notes and clicked his email again to send it. There it was again, that picture with him staring right at her. She wanted to get lost in his eyes, but she shook her head and told herself to focus on the work. I need this job, she told herself. I need to pay rent. I need my parents to believe I can take care of myself. And I need to build up the money to make a go at writing my books. She hit send on the email and sighed. I won't let anything get in the way of me doing a good job here. Not even, no, especially not a super attractive boss. Stuart could hear the sound of Christmas music leaking into his office. It was a little distracting, but he was enjoying it. He carefully checked over the report on his desk. He had been so focused on the black and white numbers that it was several minutes before he realized he was actually humming along. He stopped and cleared his throat. He didn't mind Christmas, and he definitely wasn't a Grinch, but he wouldn't be a man who sat at his desk and hummed Santa Claus is coming to town. He looked up when there was a knock at the door. Come in, he said. He looked up to see Abby open the door. Hey, she said casually. Hey. His response sounded more like a question than a greeting. I had an idea and wanted to run it past you. All right. Stuart hit a grin. He couldn't wait to hear this. 
Could we get a Christmas tree for the office? A Christmas tree? Yeah, you know it's almost Thanksgiving, and I'm a firm believer that you can't decorate for Christmas too early. So I was thinking the corner in the front of the office would be a great place for a tree. Stuart didn't miss a beat. The decorators put a tree in the lobby the day after Thanksgiving. He bent back over his paperwork, assuming that would end the conversation. Okay, but what about here in the office? Abby had come all the way to the desk now, and when he looked up, she stood right in front of him with her lip poking out. Please, she begged. It would be so nice and Christmassy. Stuart wanted to smile at her pouting face, but he held firm. I really don't think that's necessary. We have other things to do with our time. Abby sighed dramatically. <sighs> Fine. She crossed her arms and put her pouty face away. Anything I can do for you this afternoon? Actually, yes, I could use a cup of coffee. All right, I can make some. No, why don't you run down to that coffee shop? That was some really good coffee you brought yesterday. Sure, no problem. Be back soon. As Abby left, Stuart wondered about the fact that he had never had a Christmas tree in his office. Was that something people did? They had one downstairs in the lobby. Did he really need one up here, too? Of course he had one at home. The professional decorator came to decorate his home every December, although he had to admit he had thought about canceling it this year since he was the only one in the house, and since he didn't spend much time there anyway, it seemed a waste. Maybe a tree at the office made more sense. He spent more time here than at home and would enjoy that more. He shook his head. He didn't need to waste time thinking about that now. He checked his email. They had a new product launch coming just in time for Black Friday, and he needed to focus on that. As he read over details of the launch, he found his mind drifting to thoughts of Christmas, holidays, and decorating. Christmas had been a special day growing up. It was one of the few days of the year that his dad didn't go to the office. And he probably would have gone then, but Stuart's mother wouldn't allow it. They stayed home all day, the whole family, Stuart and his parents and his brother and sister, they opened presents and had a fancy lunch. It was catered, but it was delicious. Stuart remembered playing with new toys and watching Christmas movies. Plus, if they were lucky, they could go out to play in the snow. Those memories led him to thinking about the rest of the year. His dad worked every day without fail. Stuart couldn't remember him taking a sick day, and even though they took vacations, his dad would work on the trip and was always anxious to get back. His dad rarely attended a school function during the day and would often show up late for sports games or birthday parties. Stuart had always wished his dad was around more, but he had understood that the reason he had the privileges he had, private school, toys when he was little, and nice cars when he was older, every sports team or lesson he could want, were all because of his dad's work. There were times when he begrudged his dad, but overall he really understood and that was why he had decided long ago that he wouldn't have a family. When he started his own company at 22, he knew he was a businessman and only a businessman. He worked hard and had grown that business into a multi-billion dollar company, and he was proud of that. Some people would say it was a sacrifice he had made to never get married and have a family, but he considered it a simple choice. His legacy would be this company, the products that he sold, the tools that he made, the contribution to society, and the charitable giving that he did. That will be enough, he told himself, and he had always believed it. Sure, there were plenty of women who wanted to date him, even marry him, but he kept his focus on the business, and that's where his focus would stay. No Christmas tree in the office or bouncy blonde curls were going to change that. His office door opened again and in walked Abby holding a cup of coffee. Here you go, she said with that contagious smile of hers. I brought cream and sugar. Surprisingly, there weren't any notes on how you take your coffee. Black, he said. Ick, I couldn't drink coffee black. Seriously, try a little cream and sugar. It's way better. Maybe next time I'll even get you a flavored coffee. Something like vanilla cinnamon latte. I promise it tastes like Christmas in a cup. That'll get you into the holiday mood. I'll get into a holiday mood a little closer to the holidays, he said. Black coffee for me. Suit yourself. Abby shrugged as she walked away. She turned back to wag her finger at him as she said, You just wait. I'll turn you into a regular holly jolly Christmaser in no time. 
Stuart smiled after she left. He kept doing that. Something about her made him want to laugh out loud at most of the things she said. Still, he needed to get back to work, he reminded himself. That was what was important. Chapter 5 Abby shut the refrigerator door after taking out the milk to pour herself a bowl of cereal. She was exhausted from the early morning at work, but she couldn't turn her brain off to go to sleep yet. She headed to the couch and picked up the phone to call her best friend. Kim picked up in one ring. Hey, I've been waiting for you to call. Tell me everything. Kim drew out each syllable of the last word. You could have called earlier, Abby said, taking a bite. I was afraid you might still be at work, and I didn't want to get you in trouble on your first day. You said you might work some crazy hours. Yeah, I did say that. I only worked until 6.30, but got stuck in traffic on the way back, and my boss has already sent me three emails about things I need to do in the morning. Wow, that's intense, Kim said. So what kind of stuff do you do? All kinds of stuff. Mostly keep up with his schedule and make sure he has everything ready for meetings and things. His other assistant read all of his emails, but he hasn't asked me to do that. And I ordered lunch and got him coffee too, so just whatever he needs done, really. That's so cool. Kim sounded impressed. Do you think you're going to like it? I guess, Abby said. It was busy and I think there's still some more complicated things for me to learn, but it wasn't too bad. And I think I did a good job today. At least he didn't fire me yet. I'm sure you're doing a great job. He won't fire you. Maybe not, but it's all on a trial basis, so we'll have to wait and see if he wants to keep me after the holidays. I wouldn't worry about that. You'll be great. Just keep being you. Thanks. I'm pretty sure I'm doing enough of that. I might need to tone down the personality. Nah, don't do that. You be you, Abby, and you'll be just fine. Besides, it's only the first day. He'll get used to you. Kim gave a light laugh. Abby laughed too. I guess so. So, Kim let the word hang like she was waiting for something. What? Abby asked. So tell me, is he cute or what? What? Don't start that, Kim. I'm serious. I mean, I already Googled him, so I've seen his picture but I mean up close, in real life. Is he as good-looking as he seems? Out of professional courtesy, I have no comment on that. Oh, come on, Kim begged. I work with six-year-olds all day, Kim said of her job as a first-grade teacher. The most exciting thing that happens to me is my coffee break. The least you can do is share some juicy details of your super rich, public figure, fancy company owner boss. I'm just trying to do my job, Abby said. This is a big deal for me, Kim. You know how my parents are always saying I need to take things more seriously and work a real job. So that's what I'm trying to do. I got lucky when I landed it, but now I need to work on keeping it. Kim was quiet for a moment. I know, Abby. Like I said... I'm sure you're doing great, but you know you don't have to do this to prove anything to your parents. If you're happy with what you're doing, then be happy and don't worry about them. But I think you were amazing to ask him for the job and to convince him to hire you. So you've already won in my book. Thanks, Abby mumbled. But that doesn't mean you can't happen to notice if he's attractive. Thinking that won't get you fired but it might make me distracted and that might get me fired. So you admit that he's hot then? What? No, I didn't say that. But you said if you thought about it, you would be distracted, which means you do think he's attractive. Abby rolled her eyes, even though her friend couldn't see. All right, fine. You've seen his pictures. I don't have to tell you this, but he's very attractive. Yes, I knew it. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? Kim teased. I don't know. Ask me tomorrow when he's asking me for the fourth quarter sales prediction report, and I can't understand because I'm staring at his amazing blue eyes. Abby sighed. Oh, I'm sure that will be so difficult for you, staring at a handsome man all day, ordering him food and bringing him coffee. It's more than just that, Abby said, but she knew her friend was teasing. 
I know. Trust me, you'll be fine. And if you feel like you're distracted by his good looks, just think of Booker Brain Brian Smith. Ew, no way, I'm not doing that. Abby didn't ever want to think about the boy from middle school who wiped boogers everywhere he went. But it works, Kim argued. I'm telling you, you just think of him and it will knock you straight to the reality that all boys are gross and all men are just big boys. Abby laughed. So that's how you fight off all the men. Yep, sure is. And I'm living proof that it's a perfect system. Do you think you'll ever let down that guard and fall for someone? Abby asked. No plans at the moment, Kim answered. It's working pretty well right now. Abby wanted to encourage her friend to be open to possibilities, but she knew Kim would turn that advice around on her, so she kept her mouth shut. Speaking of plans, are we still on for Black Friday shopping this year? Kim wanted to know. Well, Abby's voice trailed off. Oh, come on, don't bail on me. I'm not bailing, but I don't know yet if I will have to work. Black Friday is a pretty big deal for the company, but maybe I can get a couple of hours in. I'll have to see. You just tell your boss you have a standing every single year without skipping date with your best friend to go Black Friday shopping. Abby laughed. I'm sure that will win him over, but I'll see what I can do. You do that, Kim said. I will. But Kim, I'm exhausted. I'm about to crash. I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? All right, just remember two words, booger brain. Abby laughed again. Bye, Kim. As she sat and finished her bowl of cereal, she thought about her friend's words. You don't have to do this to prove anything to your parents. Abby heard the words, but she didn't believe them. She thought about the day before when she had told her mom about the new job. Oh, honey, that's fantastic her mother had said. I always knew you would find a good job. Just stay in this one for a while, all right? She made it sound like Abby had a choice about her last position and that she had been losing jobs left and right. Her mom and dad had told her the same thing all through high school and college. Study hard so you can get a good job one day. It's important to do the job right so you can keep a job one day. Job, 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 Abby thought. It's like that's all they care about. It didn't help that her brother had paved the way by making straight A's in high school and college. Then he had to go on to medical school and become a doctor, making everyone so proud. Then there was Abby. She was a good student, but she had a harder time in classes that didn't really interest her, so she sprinkled in a few B's on her transcript. And when she finished her undergraduate degree and didn't want to pursue graduate school, she thought her parents might disown her. Her parents were solid middle-class folks, her dad was a company man who worked for the same accounting firm since she could remember. Her mom had been a counselor. She quit work to stay home with Abby and her brother when they were little, but she went back to work once they were in school. She was well known as a trainer and often traveled teaching seminars. Abby was proud of both of them, and she was proud of her brother too. But each of them was working in a career that they loved and cared about. Abby just wanted to do the same with her life. She would keep working hard at her job and hope that she did well and that her parents would be pleased. But she also planned to work even harder at writing and one day have a career that she could be proud of. So she pushed away all the negative thoughts swirling around her brain and opened up her laptop. Once again, she dove into the story. The characters seemed to have a lot to say tonight and she was happy to be back in their world. She stopped and closed her eyes to envision the scene she was writing. She tried to imagine the hero and how he looked in the scene, but when she closed her eyes, she could only imagine one face, a certain brown-haired male with stunning blue eyes. She opened her eyes and stared at the screen as she mumbled, Thanks a lot, Kim. Chapter 6 Work the next morning came bright and early. Stuart was at the office before sunrise and already hard at work. He had asked Abby to be in at eight, so he was expecting her. He heard the moment she entered the front office. She flung the door open and he could hear her headed for his door. He looked up in anticipation and watched as she threw his door back too. He did notice that she checked to make sure he wasn't on the phone, but just barely. She stood in the doorway seeming breathless. She wore a puffy winter jacket and a winter hat with a large pom-pom on the top. Guess what, 
she practically shouted, throwing her arms up in the air. What? Stuart said, eyeing her cautiously. It's snowing. Oh, really? He felt like she expected him to run to the window to check, and his calm voice seemed to deflate her enthusiasm a little. What do you mean, oh, really? She mocked him. Yes, it's snowing. The first real snow of the year. Come on, or you'll miss it. What? Stuart was genuinely shocked at her excitement. Wasn't snow for little kids to enjoy? Come on, come see the snow. I'm good, he said. Abby rolled her eyes and said again, more slowly this time. Come see the snow. Oh, all right, if it will make you stop saying that. He rose and headed towards the window, but Abby intercepted him. No, not there, outside. She took his arm and pulled him toward the door of the office, pausing to take his long overcoat from the coat rack and hand it to him. Now come on. Stuart didn't know whether to protest or just laugh at her antics. Either way, he didn't think he was getting out of this, so he decided he might as well go along with it. He managed to slip his arms into his coat on the elevator before the doors opened, and Abby caught his elbow again to pull him out the door. Once they were in the lobby, with the floor-to-ceiling windows, he could see that she was right. There was a small accumulation of snow on the ground and snowflakes were falling. Abby went ahead of him and opened the door, waiting for him to follow. The pom-pom on top of her head bobbed back and forth as she motioned with her head to go outside. Stuart smiled at the sight of her before stepping out the door. Abby held out her hands and spun around in a circle laughing. Stuart stopped and stood still, staring up at the white powdery flakes falling. The coolness of his face reminded him of Christmas as a boy. He couldn't remember the last time he had stood outside in the snow. Isn't this fantastic? Abby asked. I'll say it's not bad. It's pretty when it first starts to fall, although it's a real hassle when the roads get covered. Oh, don't be so negative. It's beautiful, and I say we celebrate the first snowfall of the year by traipsing down the block to get hot cocoa with whipped cream. What do you say? How about you go down the street for hot cocoa and bring it back to the office for me? You know, so that I can work and you can do the job I pay you to do? Oh, all right. I'll do that since you said it semi-nicely and since you did come out to see the beautiful, wonderful, happy snow. And also since I pay you? Abby met his eyes with her own and grinned. Why, yes, that too. Stuart laughed as she traipsed, as she called it, down the block. He walked in the lobby and brushed the snow from the tops of his shoulders. Going out in the snow hadn't been on his schedule, but he had to admit the cold had invigorated him, and now he felt prepared to head back in for a productive morning. He made it back to his office, hung up his coat, and took a seat at his desk. A few minutes later, Abby arrived with the hot cocoa and placed it on his desk. Your happy snow day beverage, sir. She gave a little bow after setting it down. Will you be requiring anything else this morning? Are you always this chipper first thing in the morning? He asked. Nope, this is most definitely snow day only. Hmm, I think that might be a good thing. His eyes sparkled as he teased her, and when she met his gaze, she burst out with a laugh. All right, I'll try and tone it down for the rest of the day. She pulled off her pom-pom hat and shook out her curls. Stuart watched as her long locks cascaded down her shoulders. Bits of snow fell from the hat and her hair onto the carpet. I'll get started on the list you sent me last night. Just let me know if you need anything else. With that, she left his office and closed the door with a thud. Simultaneously, Stuart felt a thud deep in his chest. Who was this woman who had waltzed into his office bringing Christmas music and snow day hot cocoa? He didn't consider himself someone who was surprised often, but she surprised him every day, if not every time she opened her mouth. Stuart sat back in his chair and sipped the hot cocoa. He imagined that Abby was out front in her office sipping hot cocoa, probably humming along to the Christmas music. Just then his phone beeped to show a text message. It was Abby. Department heads budget meeting, conference room, 15 minutes. Stuart knew he had to get his head in the game before that meeting. No snow day hot cocoa to steal his attention, but he knew there would still be a distraction in the meeting, and she would be sitting right next to him. By the end of the week, Abby felt like she was getting the hang of things pretty well. See, I said I was a fast learner. 
she told herself as she returned to her office. She had just left a meeting, probably her fifth of the week. Mr. Vincent was still there, talking with a few of the department heads, but she came back to the office to order lunch. She took in a deep breath and blew it out. It had been a long meeting, a very long meeting, she thought, as she rubbed her hands that were sore from all the typing she had done, and her brain was whirling from all of the numbers and information overload. She had never heard so many sales numbers, budget items, and income predictions. She thought back to her one business class in college and wished maybe she had paid a little bit more attention. By the time Mr. Vincent walked in the office, she had sent him over the notes and lunch was sitting on her desk. Here you go, Mr. Vincent. She stood and handed him the takeout bag. When he reached to take it, he touched her hand ever so briefly. She looked up and realized he was watching her face. Their eyes met and neither one of them moved. It only lasted for a moment, but Abby felt like it was an important moment. Please, he said without taking his eyes off her. Call me Stuart. Okay, she whispered. Did you get your lunch? He peered into the bag. Uh, yeah, right here. She motioned to the food on her desk. You didn't want to eat in my office? He asked. Abby's heart raced. Did he want her to eat in his office? With him? Oh, um, well, I just have some work to do, so I just thought I would eat here so I can multitask. Stuart cleared his throat. <clears throat> All right, I have a few things to go over with you for the rest of today and next week. So when you're done, come in and we'll talk before my afternoon conference call. Yes, sir, Abby said. She thought he seemed a little something. Disappointed? She thought. No, there's no way. I'll be in in a few minutes. Perfect. He didn't meet her eyes again as he walked away. Abby wasn't sure what to think about that. She slowly sat down and ate her lunch, but her mind was too jumbled to do any multitasking work now. She grabbed her personal cell phone and texted Kim. Just so you know, I'm mad at you. Kim texted back. And why is that? Abby, because you've made me think about my boss. Now I'm distracted and letting my mind play tricks on me, like thinking he wants me to come eat lunch in his office with him. Kim, did he ask you to eat with him? She added a wide-eyed emoji. Abby, not exactly, but he seemed to assume I would, and it was almost like he was disappointed that I didn't. Kim, and why wouldn't he be? Abby, because I'm his assistant. He probably just wanted to talk business and was frustrated that it would have to wait. I do have to say he can be a little impatient. Kim, then you two should get along just perfectly. Abby, ha ha. She added a rolling eyes emoji. Kim, are you eating lunch now? Abby, yes, at my own desk. Kim, so go in his office and say you changed your mind and then see if he talks business or not. Go on, do it. Abby, hmm, I don't know if I should follow your advice. It's your fault I'm staring at a sandwich thinking about his face. Kim, lol, that sounds like a good looking sandwich. Abby leaned back in her chair and considered Kim's idea, but still decided against it. She had to go in his office after she ate anyway, so she might as well enjoy the food without worrying if he saw her taking giant bites. Chapter 7 Call me Stuart? He could hear himself saying the words, but he couldn't believe he had said that. I have never, ever had an assistant call me Stuart. But when he had looked in her eyes, he just couldn't hear her call him Mr. Vincent one more time. What is wrong with me, he thought. Sure, he had had a wonderful assistant all those years, and she was a grandmother. Maybe that had been smarter than I thought. But there were plenty of secretaries and other assistants in the company, most of whom came to his office at different times, and plenty of them sat around the table at meetings. But none of them had ever distracted him the way Abby did, and it all seemed so effortless for her. He didn't feel like she was putting on an act, and he had been in business long enough to judge someone's character pretty quickly. No, this was the real Abby. He felt certain of that, even if nothing else.
But what did he do with the way he was feeling, the way he couldn't take his eyes off of her when she was in the room, and the way his pulse quickened when he heard her voice? Certainly he couldn't act on that. She was his assistant, after all. Even if he was looking for something, which I'm not, he told himself empathetically, he would do the only thing he could do, only think of her as his assistant and do the work they needed to do. He could do that. He was a professional. He spent the rest of the day focusing on work. Abby came and went from his office as he needed things, but he didn't initiate any extra conversations. When she came in just before leaving, she tried to make small talk, but he kept his eyes on his computer and answered her questions with brief responses. He did look up to tell her that he would be working late the following Monday and she should plan to be available all evening. Yes, sir, she said. Is there anything else before I leave today? She asked. Her voice sounded formal and even a little cold. He glanced at her to see that she had crossed her arms and looked a little put out. He hated that. No, that's all for today. He watched her walking away and couldn't stand it. Abby, he said. She turned around but stayed where she was, raising her eyebrows in anticipation of a command. Thank you for your help today. You did good work. The corners of her mouth lifted just slightly. Thanks. See you Monday. Bye. Stuart practically whispered, but she couldn't possibly have heard him. He could tell that she had noticed him being distant this afternoon, and he didn't want her to think he was rude. He leaned back and swiveled around in his desk chair. Ugh, I'm handling this all so badly. He stood and rubbed both hands over his face and then through his hair. He didn't usually talk to himself, but the situation seemed to require it. First, I tell her to call me Stuart. Then I treat her like a low-class hired hand. He paced back and forth for several minutes before finally coming back to sit at his desk. He got out a pen and piece of paper. He always thought better when he could see it in black and white on a page. And he could fix this. He was a problem solver, a creator, and a businessman who had worked through every kind of drama and problem a business could encounter. But now, as he stared at the blank page, no solutions came to mind. He was good with technology and business and even with people when it involved work, but he had kept his distance from any kind of relationship for so long that he felt lost in this situation. He sighed, but finally decided to just start writing whatever came to mind. Brainstorming, he usually called it. Free writing with no editing and no bad ideas, his high school English teacher had called it. Several minutes later, he looked at the paper that he had filled up with jumbles of words. Assistant. Professional. Kind. Funny. Excited. Bad idea. Cute. Inappropriate relationship. Workplace professionalism. Like her. Some of the words he had written small and others he had written in all caps. He went through and circled the words or phrases he had written more than once. It was quickly obvious the phrase he had written the most, and it seemed to outweigh all of the others. The words, like her. By Monday morning, Stuart had decided he would just act normal and let things happen as they happened. He wasn't planning any kind of romance, much less an office romance, but he wasn't the kind of person who could be rude to someone he worked with every day. So as a peace offering, he went by the coffee shop on his way to work and picked up what he called frilly coffee for both of them. He knew it would be a long day, and he wanted to start out on the right foot. When he heard Abby arrive, he hurried to his office door to watch as she found the coffee on the desk. She was hurrying in and walked straight to her desk. She had sat down, taken off her coat, and was opening her laptop before she looked over and saw the cup. She paused, picked it up, looking as if she was testing to see if it was warm. Seeing that it was, she turned and saw Stuart leaning on his office doorframe. He didn't say a word, but held up his own cup as if offering a toast. For me? Abby asked, pressing her hand to her chest and raising her eyebrows in curiosity. Yes, Stuart said. Well, thank you. That's a surprise. I thought I was the official coffee fetcher around here. Stuart pushed himself up from his leaning position and walked to her desk. As a matter of fact, that is the job title I listed on your employment papers. He smiled. But I thought I could take care of it. Just this once, of course. Oh, of course. Abby sipped her coffee. 
wouldn't want anybody to think you were capable of doing menial little tasks or anything. Her eyes were full of laughter as she teased him. Nope, not at all. So what's on the agenda today? She asked, opening up his literal agenda. No meetings today, he said, motioning towards her screen. Well, that's different. Today is a project proposal deadline. We have one every quarter, and this one is the most important. We get the most project proposals for this quarter every year. Each one has already been through a manager and a department head, so these are the best of the bunch. I will go over every proposal personally. Plan to order dinner for both of us. I'll need you here to assist me. All right. Anything particular you want to eat? She asked. No, whatever you want is fine. Great. And what exactly will you need me to do? Assist me. Meaning? I might ask you to look something up, research an idea, or look at a competitor's product that is similar. Or I might need you to run projection numbers with me. And then I can bounce ideas off of you. Who knows? Maybe I'll even ask your opinion. He winked at her before he could stop himself. She laughed. Really? Me? You just might want to know what I think about an idea? He shrugged. I said maybe. Abby laughed again. All right, you just leave dinner to me, and I'll be here for all the menial work and all the idea bouncing and opinion giving. Perfect, Stuart said, and truly he believed it was. Abby thanked the delivery guy and carried the food bags to Stuart's office. They had already been reading over proposals for a couple of hours, and she was thankful for the break. Stuart stood when she walked in and started trying to make space on the desk for the food. No, no, Abby shook her head. Let's eat over here. She pointed with her head towards the leather couch and coffee table off to the side of his office. Do you ever sit over here? It looks much more comfortable than those desk chairs. Stuart stuck his hands in his pockets and walked towards her. He had loosened his tie and rolled up his shirt sleeves. Not really. The designer put it in, but I just get more work done sitting at a desk. Yes, but at least when you're here at night, no one else is expecting you to be so formal at your desk. You could at least kick back and relax a little while you read over proposals. While she spoke, Abby had laid out the food on the table and grabbed two water bottles out of the office mini-fridge. Now she motioned for Stuart to take the seat beside her on the couch. Stuart looked indecisive for the first time since she had met him. He took slow, hesitant steps around the coffee table and sat a few inches away from her. Thanks for setting this up. It looks delicious. You're welcome. I thought it was time you had a decent meal, even if it is eaten in your office. This is nice. Thanks. They sat in silence for a few minutes while they ate. Stuart was the first to speak. So about the proposal we were working on. Abby held up her hand to stop him. Nope. We're on a dinner break right now. No business talk while we eat. Let's talk about something else. Like what? Stuart seemed puzzled at this suggestion. Anything. I barely know anything about you, so just start with something about yourself and it will be new to me. Stuart cleared his throat. <clears throat> All right. Well, I hate golf. Abby burst out laughing, nearly choking on the bite of food in her mouth. She composed herself and put her hand to her chest. You hate golf? That is the most random statement I have ever heard anyone say. Hmm, I doubt that. But it's not that random, really. I'm a businessman, and it's kind of stereotypical for me to play golf, watch golf, and talk about golf. But really, I can't stand it. Tell me more, Abby said. It's just so boring, slow, and quiet. I just want them to hurry up and move on. Abby laughed again. So do you like other sports? Football? No, not football. They take an hour to play 15 minutes worth of the game. But I can watch a game of soccer. That's where the action is. I enjoy watching football, but I can't really argue with you there. Your turn. My turn for what? To tell me something about yourself that I don't know. Oh, all right then. Let me think of something as random as, I hate golf. She smiled to show she was teasing him. Um, I've never been outside of the country. Really? Yep, really. I've always wanted to travel somewhere, but just hasn't happened yet. I do have a passport that I keep up to date, just in case I need to flee the country on a moment's notice. You really should make use of that. There's a lot of things to see in the world. Maybe one day I'll have time off work and a private jet to fly me anywhere I want to go. Stuart laughed. 
Well, I only have one of those things. And speaking of work, I'm officially finished eating, so I think we're allowed to talk about the projects again. Abby rolled her eyes. Fine, but only if I can reserve the right to request more random personal facts in between proposals. Stuart seemed to consider that for a moment and finally said, It's a deal. Chapter 8 You know what we need? What's that? Stuart's eyes lit up with the possibility of what she might say. We need a break, and... Stuart raised his eyebrows in anticipation, and... Abby stood up and spread her arms wide for emphasis. We need a Christmas tree. Stuart smiled but shook his head. We talked about that. They'll put one up in the lobby in a few days. But we need one here in our office for us to enjoy, and we need it tonight. Tonight? Yep, tonight. No, we still have proposals to go over. But are we really going to finish all of them tonight? There's still so many left. There's no way we will make it through all of them tonight. It will probably take us all week to finish. But tonight we need a Christmas tree. Come on. She reached out and grabbed his arm to pull him off the couch. He allowed her to pull him and stood up till they were face to face. He reached out and tugged a curl that hung in front of her face. Where are we going to get a tree right now? There's plenty of stores open 24 hours. Come on, we'll figure it out on the way. She didn't wait for him but hurried out of the office. He had no choice but to follow her, and in that moment he knew he didn't want to do anything else. He grabbed his phone and texted his driver. Within a few minutes, Stuart and Abby had put on hats and coats and exited the back private entrance of the building. Stuart's driver picked them up just outside the door. Nice, Abby said as she slid into the sleek black sedan. The leather seats were heated and warmed for their arrival. Where to, sir? The driver asked. Abby? Stuart turned to her and waited for her instruction. What's open? She asked. Target? Patrick, is there a target nearby? Yes, sir. All right, then take us there. Yes, please. Abby said in a terrible fake British accent. Take us to Target, Patrick. She laughed quietly. What? Stuart said. Nothing, Abby said, stifling a laugh. It's just so unbelievable, like this is really your life. Yeah, it is. I guess you just get used to it. Well, yeah, I guess I could get used to this pretty quickly. Stuart had never seen someone have this much fun in a store, he hadn't done much but push the shopping cart and watch Abby as she flitted from aisle to aisle, tossing things in. They had picked out an artificial tree. He had finally agreed to the decoration but vetoed a real tree. He had also wanted something small, but she had talked him into the nine-foot tree. Truly, he thought she could talk him into just about anything if she had enough time. The tree was pre-lit, but she said they needed ornaments and a star for the top and then other ornaments— so here they were, walking the aisles of Target, which he couldn't remember stepping foot into before now, and she was carefully selecting every item. What colors do you think for ornaments? Red and silver? Blue? Green? Stuart didn't care much what color they used, and he almost said so, but when he looked at her with her head tilted to the side, eager to hear his opinion, he made a decision on the spot. I think red and silver look the most traditional. Abby smiled. Yes, I think so, too. She picked up a few boxes of each and added them to the cart. She held onto the edge of the cart as they rounded the next aisle where she picked up a red tree skirt. It was velvety-looking and trimmed with satin ribbon. Now here's what we really need, she said with a smirk. She picked up a red and white Santa hat and quickly walked towards Stuart. No, no. He held his hand up and tried to duck away. But that didn't stop her. She planted the hat on his head and she giggled. Stuart reached to stop her, but instead caught both of her hands in his. It's perfect on you, Abby said. Their eyes met as he lowered both of their hands down in between them. Well, I think it would look great on you. Stuart quickly reached up and grabbed the hat and placed it on her head instead. Abby squealed and pulled it off before he could get a chance to see her in it. Come on now, don't mess up my hair, she said jokingly. I don't think that's possible. Stuart said without thinking. Um, I mean, it didn't mess anything up. It's fine. 
Of course, he did think her hair always looked great. In the past few days he had known her, he had seen it straight, curly, and pulled back from her face. Never once did he think it could possibly look bad. But he hadn't meant to say it out loud. Abby looked at him for a moment. I guess maybe that's a compliment. If so, I'll take it. She raised her eyebrows as if it was a question. Stuart took a breath and then looked her straight in the eyes and said, Yes, definitely a compliment. He hadn't known it was possible, but she blushed. Full-on pink washed over her entire face, and for the first time she seemed unsure of what to say. Stuart reached out to her and took the hat from her hands. He placed it on his head and grinned at her. Come on, he said. Let's pick out a star for the top. Then maybe we can stop for hot cocoa on the way back to the office. I can't say no to that, Abby said, smiling. She led him down two more aisles, and they did manage to find the perfect star for the tree. They arrived back at the office, carrying the bags of decorations along with the promised hot cocoa. Stuart hadn't realized how much stuff they had bought until it took two trips from the car to carry it all. You know, we really should get back to the proposals. Should we? Abby asked, already opening the box with the tree. Stuart couldn't hide his smile. Yes, I do actually need to get them done. But like you said, we can't finish them all tonight, so we'll do the tree and start on them when we're all fresh tomorrow. Stuart cocked his head and held his hand to his chest. Did I say that? He asked. Abby shrugged. Maybe. I mean, somebody said it, so might as well have been you. Now she was struggling to pull the tree out of the box. She had the box standing upright, and every time she lifted it out a little, the weight of it pulled her back down. Here, let me. Stuart went to her, and with both hands he lifted the heavy tree out of the box and set it on the floor. Abby looked up and fluttered her eyelashes at him. My hero. I do what I can, Stuart said with a shrug. He bent down and started fluffing the branches of the bottom section of the tree. They both went to work assembling the three pieces of the tree and the room fell silent as they each worked on different sections of the branches. You know what we need? Every time you say that, it makes me nervous, Stuart said. Abby's laugh filled the room and made his heart skip a beat. She patted his arm and she said, Don't worry, this one doesn't require driving anywhere or buying anything. We just need Christmas music. Ah, uh, of course, allow me. He whipped out his phone, and in seconds the wireless speaker started playing rocking around the Christmas tree. Abby stared at him wide-eyed. You saved Christmas music on your phone? Yes, I hate to admit it, but I did. You're a bad influence on me. Ha, huh, I think I'm a great influence. What made you pick this one? It's my favorite Christmas song, he said. Really, I didn't even know you had a favorite Christmas song. Sure I do. I may not seem like it, but Christmas has always been my favorite holiday. I just think it's mostly for kids. I loved Christmas Day growing up. Tell me what that was like, Abby said. She was bent over picking up the boxes of decorative balls and came over to hand him one. He took it and looked at her, considering how much to say. It surprised him that he could talk to her so easily, and it made him want to tell her everything. Christmas Day was always a big deal. My dad would stay home from work all day, pretty much the only time he did that. And my brother and sister and I would get up early and creep to the top of the stairs and just stare at all the gifts under the tree. We weren't allowed to come down until my parents were up. I guess they wanted to see our faces when we opened everything, so we would sit there for a few minutes waiting, and then we would go and beg them to get up so we could go downstairs. He stopped hanging the ornaments and rubbed the stubble on his chin. It was fun. Then once they got up, we would just go all day. Presents, food, playing with what we got, eating too much candy. I remember a few special gifts, like when we got a game system and the year I got a remote control airplane. But mostly I don't remember the things we got. I just remember the feeling of that day. Some years things might have been stressful or my dad was gone a lot. But on Christmas, it was just Christmas, and it was happy and fun. He glanced over to see that Abby had stopped decorating and stood watching him and listening intently. What is it? He asked. That's so nice, Abby said. I'm not really sure what I expected you to say, but it wasn't that. Stuart chuckled. 
Did you think I was going to talk about how I got a new car every year or that we went on a European Christmas vacation? Abby shrugged and dropped her head. I don't know. Then she looked up and bit her lip. I mean, maybe, sort of. He gave her a reassuring smile. It's all right. I know it's different. My dad worked hard, and we had a lot growing up, but it wasn't always about the stuff. Abby smiled and went back to the tree. What about you? Stuart asked. Tell me about your Christmas growing up. Now that you say it that way, it doesn't sound too different from yours. We would be home all day, open presents, eat too much candy, but I remember always being so excited to see what I would get. We would ask for things for Christmas, but we never really knew what would show up under the tree. So what was your most memorable gift? Stuart asked. Abby laughed. It will probably sound silly. Come on, tell me. So I've always wanted to be a writer. I spent all this time writing stories and scratching out notes on pieces of paper, and my dresser in my room and my floor was always covered with paper. My favorite thing was a new notebook full of empty pages, just brimming with the possibilities of new ideas and new stories. So this one year, my mom decided I needed a place to keep them. On Christmas Day, there was this giant thing in the middle of the living room floor, completely wrapped in wrapping paper with a big bow on top. My brother really hoped it was a dirt bike, even though that was crazy. My mom finally said it was for me, so I ran over and started ripping all the paper off. And it was this little desk. It had plenty of space on top, and she had got me a desk organizer and new pens and paper, and on the bottom it had this little file cabinet drawer, and it was full of file folders for me to keep my stories. She sighed a happy sigh. That sounds like your mom really put a lot of thought into that. Yes, she did. So she supported your dream then? Abby rolled her eyes. I guess she did then but now my parents both think it's ridiculous that I want to have a career as a writer. She covered her mouth with her hand. Oops, I guess I shouldn't say that to my boss. What? Stuart feigned shock. You mean you don't want to be my assistant and bring coffee and sit in meetings you don't care about for the rest of your life? Avi laughed. Well, maybe not, but I really am very happy to be working here now. I just also would like to write my stories one day and be able to share them with the world. Then I think you should. Abby sighed. If only it were that easy. And why isn't it? Well, the writing part is easy. The making a living part of it, not so much. Any career worth having takes work. I agree, Abby said. But it's hard when everyone around you is saying it will never happen. Your parents? Yeah, mostly. Abby paused and seemed to focus her attention on the ornaments. And someone else? Stuart pushed the boundaries of his questions. Abby glanced at him, but then kept her eyes on the tree as she spoke. A guy that I dated, pretty seriously, actually. He told me flat out that my writing was a joke and it would never make money. That's when I realized that money was what mattered to him. I'm sorry, Abby, Stuart said. I know it hurts when those around you don't think you can do something. Yes, it stings. Stuart nodded slowly. You know, when I wanted to start this company, my dad thought I was crazy. He had worked his way up in the business world by proving himself to his bosses and climbing the corporate ladder. He was 40 before he became the president of the company he was working for then, and he just couldn't imagine a 22-year-old doing anything but going to work for a successful company. I guess you proved him wrong. Stuart laughed, which lightened the mood. Considering he works for my company now, I guess so. So how did you get started? I mean, I've read the Tech Wonder Boy stories, but I'd like to hear it from you. It started with one idea, one product that I envisioned that no one else was making. And to me it seems so simple, but no one else was doing it, so everyone thought it was a bad idea. But I wasn't going to give up. I built my own machine with parts I bought or built by hand, and it just grew from there. I did have my dad's connections to bring it to market, so obviously that gave me a leg up. But the ideas were all mine. Then, that one product was a huge success, so it led to new ideas and more products. It seemed like it grew really quickly, because it did. But it was all the little ideas and little steps by a lot of people. I decided early on to hire the best people in the business and to encourage everyone to do their best work. I do work a lot 
but that's because I love this. I love the products we build. I love the company and I love doing the work. I want other people who feel the same way, but I also want them to be able to do what they love. I'm sorry, Abby, because being my assistant means keeping up with my work level, but I encourage a work-life balance for our other departments and employees, and I think that helps people be happy to work here. It brings out the best in people when they're happy. Wow, Abby said. That's really incredible, Stuart. His heart thudded at the sound of her voice saying his name. It was the first time she had used his first name. He looked at her now, her hair sticking out from the Santa hat that she had taken from him in the car. She had plugged in the lights, and the room seemed to glow. He couldn't decide if it was the tree or the way she gazed at him in awe. He had been called a lot of things because of his success, but in that moment he hoped she would always look at him that way. And that was better than any accolade he had ever received. He reached up to her hand on the tree and took it in his. Thank you, Abby. For what? She practically whispered. Stuart had stepped towards her now, and they were only inches apart. For bringing Christmas back to me and reminding me what it's like to just talk to someone. Don't you talk to people? Sometimes, but not often when it's not about work or business, and definitely not about my goals and dreams. But you haven't told me about your goals and dreams. Most people would say I've reached all my goals, having success in business, money, fame. His voice dropped low. But I'm starting to think I might have a new dream, one I didn't even know I wanted. Abby's mouth went dry. Her heart was pounding so loud she was sure Stuart could hear it over the sound of the Christmas music. She didn't know what to say. Is he really talking about me? She wondered. No, he can't be. Can he? She locked eyes with him and told herself to breathe. It was several seconds before she listened to herself. She took a deep breath and then cleared her throat and looked away from him. She pulled her hand away and brushed it over the tree. I think this looks pretty good, don't you? She could still feel his eyes on her when he said, Beautiful. Abby stepped back to take in the full view of the tree. It was simple but elegant enough for the office, and the glow of the lights was everything she had hoped for. Now it just needs the star. She turned to pick it up from the box. Do you want to do the honors? She asked, holding it out to Stuart. He held up his hands. No, no, this is your project. You need to see it through to completion. Abby grinned. All right, is there a step stool or something around here? Hmm, I don't think so. He glanced around looking for something to stand on. Here, let me grab the desk chair. Abby's eyes grew wide. I don't think that's a good idea. It has wheels. Oh, it will be fine. I'll hold the chair. I won't let you fall, Stuart said. Abby rolled her eyes. All right. She held the star while Stuart pushed the chair over. He put it just beneath the tree and dutifully placed both hands on the sides of the chair. Abby carefully climbed up, feeling very aware of how close Stuart was. Slowly, she reached up as far as she could to place the star atop the tree and plug it in. Quick, she said. Go turn out the light so we can see it. Forgetting her fear of falling, she tapped Stuart's arm to push him towards the switch. A flash of uncertainty came over Stuart's face, but he slowly took his hands from the chair and made sure it was balanced before running to the wall and switching the lights off. Abby sucked in her breath at the sight of the lights filling the dark room. It was everything she had hoped for. Yay! She cheered as she raised her hands above her head in victory. When she did, the chair swiveled around and at the same time it started to roll backwards. The jerk of motion threw Abby off balance. She cried out as she leaned forward and tried to right herself, but instead fell backwards. She wildly tried to grab anything she could, but there was nothing, and she fell backwards out of the chair. Clenching her teeth, she prepared to crash onto the floor. Instead, she felt a pair of strong arms appear from nowhere to catch her. Oof, she said as she landed in Stuart's arms. Her eyes were wide and her mouth fell open. She turned to see his face, and Stuart's expression was full of fear. Are you all right? he asked. Um, yeah, I think so. Goodness, you're quick. I didn't know you could cover ground that fast. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Abby giggled. I don't think I would have died from falling out of a chair. Stuart smiled. 
I didn't want to take the risk. You know a good assistant is hard to find, and I've already lost one this month. Oh, so you think I'm a good assistant? I think you're the perfect assistant for me, he said. Abby suddenly became very aware that he was cradling her in his arms and that her face was inches away from his, not to mention their lips. His eyes met hers, and she saw him glance down at her lips. Excitement washed over her, as well as nervousness and finally panic. I, uh, she spoke up quickly. I think it's safe to put me down now. Oh, right, sorry about that. Don't be sorry, I just don't want your arms to get tired. Stuart set her down on the floor as he said, I'm not tired. Yes, well, let's take a look at the fantastic work we have done on this tree. She stepped back and stood next to him as they admired the decor. Their arms brushed against each other as they stood close. I would say it's a job well done. Me too, Abby said. Job well done. Chapter 9 Stuart sat in his office trying to listen to a conference call, but he was distracted. This was so unlike him, but he had laid awake all night thinking about the moment when he had had Abby in his arms, the moment he had thought about kissing her, and he wasn't the one who had stopped it. She was. Would I really have kissed her? He had wondered. He really couldn't say, but he knew that he had wanted to then, and he still wanted to now. Abby had been kind but professional this morning. He had even heard her call him Mr. Vincent more than once. He hoped she was just trying to be professional, but he wondered if she was trying to clue him in that she was pushing him away. He sighed because he didn't know the answer. His call ended and he felt like he hadn't given it his best, which was what he asked of not only his employees but himself. I can't do this, he told himself. I need to focus but at that moment he heard voices outside his door. They sounded very chatty and not businesslike. He stood and walked to the door where he could hear. The voices didn't sound familiar to him, but they seemed to be familiar with Abby. He barely cracked the door to try and get an idea who it was before he walked out. Abby, your dad and I are just so proud of you. Thanks, Mom, I appreciate that. Abby's voice sounded strained, but he was thankful she had clued him into who it was. He was reaching for the door to open it all the way when Abby's mom continued. We just think it's so great you found this position, and it seems like it's going so well. And I mean, Abby, this office. Stuart imagined that she was taking in the spacious building. You need to just make sure you work hard and keep this job. I'm doing the best I can, Abby said. I know you are, honey. This is just so great. A male voice spoke up now. Yes, it is great. We're proud of you and really just hope that now you can focus on this job and put away the foolish idea of making a career as a writer. Stuart's heart sank to his stomach as he heard those words. How dare they belittle her dream like that? He could feel anger rise up inside him. I would never talk that way to someone I care about. Without his permission, his heart added, and Abby is someone I care about. He didn't wait any longer to make his appearance. He opened the door wide and pasted on a smile just as wide. Hello there, I'm Stuart Vincent. Oh, hello. Abby's mother smiled, showing all her teeth and reached out to shake hands. I'm Beverly Williams, and this is my husband, Phil. These are my parents. Abby stood as she spoke. It's nice to meet you both. Stuart shook both of their hands. Were you in the area? Yes, we were just downtown doing some early Christmas shopping. Beverly was practically fawning over him. We just wanted to stop by and see where Abby works. We're happy to have you. I'm glad you got to see her doing such a great job. She is an excellent assistant and we stay very busy. Oh yes, I'm sure you have lots of work to do. We'll say goodbye and let you get back to it. It's no problem, Stuart smiled. You're welcome to stop by any time. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. We're so happy for her to be working for you. We'll get back to our shopping and let you work. Bye, Abby. She went to Abby and gave her a quick hug. Come on, Phil. Let's let Abby do her job. Bye, Mom. Bye, Dad. Abby said as they left. Once they were out the door, Abby turned to Stuart. Thanks for saving me. Me? Stuart pretended not to understand. 
I didn't do anything. Abby stood and stepped close to him. Oh, yes, you did, and I'm grateful. She reached out and touched his arm just briefly. I love my parents, but they can be a little overwhelming sometimes. Stuart returned the gesture and reached out and grasped her elbow as he spoke. I understand. I'm happy to be a buffer any time. Thanks, Abby said quietly. He saw the sadness in her expression left there by her parents' words. An idea came to him, and he decided to act on it right then. I have to run an errand, so I'll be back in a little while, and we can get back to the project proposals. Is that all right? Sure, Abby said. A smile spread over her face. You're the boss. She furrowed her eyebrows then and said, But wait, you have an errand? Isn't that my job? Yes, it is, but this is something I need to do myself. Abby shrugged. All right, I'll see you when you get back then. Stuart wished he could hug her then and tell her everything would be all right, but he didn't. He went back to his office to grab his coat and phone and texted his driver to meet him out back. He was already searching online for the item he had in mind, and in a few minutes he had a list of possible shops where he could find it, and he was off. A couple of hours later he slowly walked toward the office door. In his hand he held a small red gift bag. He listened before walking in to make sure Abby wasn't on the phone and that no one else was in the office. He wanted her full attention. When he opened the door, she looked up. She smiled when she saw it was him. He watched her face as her eyes moved down to the bag in his hand. He could see delight and then confusion and then a look that he thought must be her telling herself the gift wasn't for her. She pasted on a smile and spoke. Did you finish your errand without any problems? Yep, I sure did. He went to her and sat on the edge of her desk. I wanted to do this myself, because this is for you. Her mouth fell open as he held it out to her. Really? For me? Why? Just something I wanted to get for you. Go ahead, open it. She blushed as she pulled the tissue paper out and pulled out the small item wrapped inside. She unfolded the paper slowly and carefully to reveal a Christmas ornament. She gasped as she took it in. It was tiny books lined up in a row, and then beneath was one book, showing the spine with the words, By Abby Williams. Stuart watched her as she held it tenderly in the palm of her hand and ran her fingers over her own name. When she was silent, he asked, What do you think? She turned to face him, and he saw the tears filling her eyes. It's beautiful. I can't believe you did this. I wanted you to have a special ornament to hang on the tree. Thank you. She stood and embraced him, her arms going around his neck. Stuart wrapped both of his arms around her waist and breathed her in. They stood there without moving for several moments. Abby finally leaned back to look him in the eyes and said, I don't think anyone has ever really believed that I could be a writer. Well, I do, Stuart said, making sure she could see in his eyes that he meant it. Thank you. Abby brushed at her eyes and stepped back from him. That really means a lot to me. Stuart wasn't sure what else to say. Take your time, and whenever you're ready, we can start working on the projects again. The rest of my day is cleared for this, so I thought we would get crazy and sit on the couch out here by the tree. Wow, Abby said wide-eyed. That is crazy. You're really stepping out of your comfort zone, aren't you? Oh, you have no idea. Stuart smiled at her. The day flew by for Abby. She didn't know she could enjoy a day of work so much. She was beginning to see why Stuart did what he did and why he loved his job. She was starting to love her job, but she had a little something inside her telling her that it was more because of him than the job itself. The day seemed a little more relaxed than the past few weeks had. At one point, she caught herself watching Stuart as he read off a proposal and thought about how he had changed over the course of the week. Or maybe it was just that he had opened up to her and they were actually becoming friends. Either way, she was beginning to see that he was a genuinely nice person and not just a stuffy businessman. It was well past what Abby would have considered a normal dinner hour when she leaned her head back on the couch as Stuart closed one more proposal. Her stomach chose that moment to let out a deep rumble and she sat up quickly wide-eyed and embarrassed. Stuart let out a laugh. I'm sorry, I didn't realize how late it was getting. You must be starving. Nope, Abby said quickly, not even hungry. 
Stuart scooted over from his seat on the couch and brushed her nose with his index finger. Liar. Just joking, since I don't think I could cover that growl. Should I order some food to be brought over? She said, reaching for her phone. Actually, I have a better idea. Oh? Let's get out of here. I'm sure you've had enough of the office for a while, and it would be nice to stretch my legs. Are you sure? Yes, of course. The projects will still be here when we get back. All right. Abby stood and reached for her coat. Where to? If you don't mind walking a little, there's a great little Italian place a few blocks away. Sounds good to me. They made their way down the elevator and out the doors to find that it was lightly snowing. Abby pulled her coat tighter around herself. Stuart noticed and offered, If it's too cold, we can take the car. No, no, absolutely not. I love seeing the snow. It was only a few minutes' walk to the restaurant, and they were seated at a table right away. They both ordered salads in the dinner special. I'm so hungry, I'm not sure I even care what I eat, Abby said. But she changed her tune when the food arrived and proclaimed it the most delicious Italian food she had ever had. I told you it was good, Stuart said. They kept the conversation going all through dinner. Stuart asked her about her story ideas, and she blushed to tell him of the romance she was working on and Abby peppered him with questions about high school and college and how he knew he wanted to go into the tech business. She felt like she was getting to know the real Stuart now. After dinner, Abby begged to stop by a grocery store before going back to the office. I need some candy to keep me going. No problem. There was a small corner grocery store a block over, so they walked as the snow started to fall heavier on their hats and coats. They entered the store, and it didn't take Abby long to find the candy aisle and pick up a number of things. She even added some salty snacks to her basket. Just in case, she said. As they rounded the aisle to the checkout counter, they saw a woman standing there, talking to the cashier. Please, sir, I could sweep the floor or clean the bathrooms, anything at all. I'm sorry, ma'am, we're just not hiring right now. I could just work today in exchange for snacks or milk, really anything. Abby glanced at Stuart, and she saw that he had slowed his steps. He lowered his head and listened intently as the woman spoke. Please, it's for my kids. I'm sorry I can't help. The clerk turned away and left the woman standing there. She covered her face and took a deep breath before taking slow steps toward the door. Ma'am? Stuart's deep voice surprised Abby, and the woman stopped in her tracks. She turned and looked at him without a word. Is there something I can help you with? She nearly crumpled, and the tear she had been holding back fell then. I'm sorry, mister. I'm not asking for charity, but I lost my job and I just need something to feed my kids. I saved enough to pay the rent, but we're out of groceries. I just need something to feed them. I offered to do work. I'm not asking for charity. Abby could see the pride in her eyes and knew the woman was telling the truth. Maybe I can help. I've been trying to find a job, the woman said. My husband left us eight months ago, and I've been trying to get by, but it's not easy. What kind of work do you do? Stewart asked. Abby was in awe of the kindness in his voice. Manufacturing, but you know all the companies keep moving everything overseas to save money, and the little people are the ones who lose their jobs. Stewart rubbed his chin. Yes, ma'am, I understand that. Ma'am, I would like to help you out tonight. If you would, please go get some groceries and I'll take care of it. The woman began to sob. Are you serious? Yes, just get what you need. We'll wait here for you. Oh, thank you. God bless you, she said. But she didn't wait to be told twice and hurried off to grab a cart and started adding items. Abby watched as she carefully selected the items. She seemed to be trying to make wise decisions and not take too much. A few minutes later, the woman was back at the counter with food. Is this all right? She eyed Stuart cautiously. Stuart barely glanced at the food. Yes, it's perfectly fine. Abby looked closer to see that she had chosen lunch meats and cheese, crackers and granola bars, jars of peanut butter and jelly, along with bread and milk. There were no cookies or snacks or sweets to speak of. When the woman began unloading the items, Abby walked to the counter and laid down her candy and snacks. The woman looked up at her with confusion on her face. Abby smiled and nodded at her. Stuart stepped up to pay for the items. As the cashier rang them up, Stuart asked, Do you have store gift cards? Yes, sir, the man said. I would like to add a $100 gift card to my purchase. Yes, sir. 
The woman didn't speak, but Abby could tell she was crying all over again. Stuart turned to her as she took the grocery bags. What's your name, ma'am? Stephanie Lewis. Stephanie, I want you to use the gift card to come back next week and get groceries again. I can't promise anything, but this is my business card. I'd like you to call my office and speak with my assistant. I would like to see if we can help you find a job. Stephanie took the card and her groceries. Tears were streaming down her face as she said, Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Then she turned and hurried out the door. Abby and Stuart stood in silence for a few minutes, watching the door where she had disappeared. Finally, Stuart spoke. Do you want to get more candy? He asked. Abby shook her head and looped her arm through his. I think I've had my fill of sweetness for the evening. Chapter 10 Abby hadn't stopped thinking about Stuart and the woman in the store for days. Of course she knew he had the resources to do something like that, but he didn't have to. Plenty of people would have let her walk out without a word and never thought about it again. But she had seen the kindness in Stuart's eyes and heard the compassion in his voice. He had seen a need and had reached out to help. Two weeks had passed practically in a blur. Stuart and Abby had worked side by side every day. Abby had gotten used to ordering meals in for dinner as they worked late hours. She managed to sneak in a quick visit with her parents for Thanksgiving Day, and Kim was thrilled that Abby managed to keep their Black Friday date. Never mind that Abby nearly fell asleep on the couch in Stuart's office over lunch. But every day she felt like she got to know just a little bit more about Stuart, and even though she tried not to admit it, she liked him more and more every day. Now, as she rode the elevator up to the office, she sighed a dreamy sigh. He really was a hero, not just to the woman in the store, but to Abby. She had fought even thinking he was cute, but now she wanted to let herself fall for him. Before she stepped off the elevator, she cleared her throat and reminded herself to be professional. This was her job, after all. She opened the office door and walked through to find Stuart sitting at her desk. She tilted her head as she said a confused, good morning, but she barely got the words out before he rushed to where she stood. Whatever you have on your to-do list today, you need to cancel it. Abby stood frozen in place with her purse on her arm and her coffee in her hand. Um, well, okay. I work for you, so whatever you need me to do is my to-do list. Oh, that's right, Stuart grinned, but this is an emergency. She raised her eyebrows. Like a real emergency? Like is someone hurt? No, no one is hurt. He dropped his gaze to the floor in mock injury. But I might be hurt if you say no. Why? Abby asked in surprise. Come on, sit down over here, he said, leading her to the couch. When she was sitting down, he began again. So tonight, there is a big charity event that I have to go to. I saw event listed on your agenda, but I didn't have any details, so I didn't ask. Right. It's the Mistletoe Charity Ball. It's a big fancy event, and we're a corporate sponsor. It's a benefit for the Children's Hospital. In my position, it's pretty much a faux pas to go to this kind of event without a date. But I've been so busy at work and so immersed that I haven't thought about finding someone to take. Uh-huh, Abby said slowly. Her heart raced as she tried to convince herself he wasn't going to say what she thought he was going to say. And you want me to help by... She let the sentence hang. Well, as my assistant, it's your duty to help with whatever tasks I need help with. Yes, that's right. Abby steeled herself against being asked to go as his assistant. But as my friend, and someone I enjoy being around, I would really like for you to attend the event with me tonight. Would you? Abby took note of the tactful way he asked her to attend the event, not to be his date. But that was something she could live with. She tapped her chin with her finger and pretended to consider his offer. Hmm, well, well, Stuart asked impatiently, his expression eager. Sure, I'll go. Perfect. But I don't know anything about these kind of fancy events. I'm sure I don't have anything to wear. And that is exactly why you need to cancel your plans for today. I have already spoken to my driver, and he's prepared to take you to whatever shops you would like. Here, take this. He handed her an envelope. This should cover whatever you need, but if it doesn't, let me know. Abby's mouth fell open and she stared at him in shock. Are you serious? 
Yes, I absolutely am, Stuart said. He looked her in the eyes and furrowed his eyebrows. He seemed to be trying to gauge how she felt about this. Is that all right? Abby laughed. Is it all right if you send me up on a shopping spree to get ready for a fancy charity ball? Yes, I think so. Good, he said, seeming relieved. And you know, I'm nothing if not a researcher. So to be helpful, I managed to find some photos of the event from last year so you can take a look at the dresses to see what might be appropriate. I figured that was safer than me trying to describe clothing options to you. Abby laughed again. Yes, indeed. And I don't want you back here today. I'll be by to pick you up at six. What? Abby practically shouted. How will you make it the entire day without an assistant? I'll manage somehow, Stuart sighed dramatically. Abby eyed him for a moment. You're sure? Yes, definitely. All right, then, I'll do it. Good, Patrick is waiting for you outside, and have him take you somewhere for lunch, too. Abby stood, suddenly feeling reluctant to leave, knowing she wouldn't see him the whole day. I guess I'll go then. Have a nice time, Stuart said. He stood with her and reached up to brush a strand of her hair behind her ear. He let his hand drop to her shoulder. I'll be looking forward to seeing you tonight. Abby swallowed before she was able to speak. Stuart, she said, just one question. Did you ever take Joyce to a fancy dinner event? Absolutely not. Abby stood before the mirror in her apartment, checking to see if her makeup needed any touch-ups. The entire day had been a whirlwind. She had been to three shops, trying on dress after dress. She asked herself a million questions for each one. Is this right for the event? Will I be comfortable? Should I spend this much? But the most important question in her mind every time was the same. Will Stuart like it? She had studied the pictures from the previous event, trying so hard to make sure she would fit in and wouldn't be an embarrassment to him. This was obviously quite a social event. The newspaper article had shown other prominent businessmen as well as city leaders. Even the mayor had been in attendance. And from what Abby could see, all the women wore full-length gowns and had their hair and makeup professionally styled. She had skipped that since she was more comfortable doing her own hair, but she had stopped in to have a manicure and pedicure. Her shopping purchases had not only included a dress, but shoes, jewelry, and a purse. She hadn't wanted to be too extravagant, but she kept reminding herself that she needed to look the part for Stuart and that she hadn't come close to spending all of the money in the envelope. Now she looked herself over. The red dress had won over all the others. She kept telling herself it was because the style was the most flattering, but she knew it was because Stuart had chosen red for the Christmas tree decorations. The sleeveless dress had a halter neckline and the hem fell to the floor just covering the silver peep-toe heels she wore. She had curled her hair and pulled the front up and let her curls cascade over her shoulders and down her back. She looked at the clock and nervously twisted one of her curls. Stuart would be there any minute. Abby grabbed her phone to text Kim. She had sent her dozens of texts throughout the day with dress and shoe options and, what do you think of these earrings? Now she sent one last message. Leaving soon, wish me luck. Kim immediately responded. You don't need luck in that dress. Abby blushed, but she didn't have time to text back since she got another text, this one from Stuart. Pulling up now. Want me to come to your apartment? Definitely not, she said out loud. She typed, no need, I'll head down to meet you. She took a deep breath and tried to encourage herself. Here we go. Stuart stepped outside the limo and stood waiting. He tucked his hands in his pockets and leaned against the vehicle. He knew she would be surprised by the car, and he almost felt like it was a little cheesy, but he had decided to pull out all the stops tonight. He heard a sound coming from the steps of the apartment building, and he looked up to see her. His heart nearly stopped inside his chest. The red dress, the blonde curls. He wanted to speak, but his voice wouldn't work. Hey, Abby called out as she came closer. Does this look all right? Stuart nodded slowly, never taking his eyes off her. It's perfect, he said, and he knew he was a goner. Oh, good, Abby let out a breath and then slipped on the coat she carried over her arm. I just wanted to make sure I would fit in. Stuart's smile spread across his entire face. Well, I'm afraid you missed that mark, 
because in that dress, I'm absolutely certain you will be the standout of the night. Abby blushed and stepped back as he opened the door for her. She seemed to notice the limo for the first time. Oh, wow, arriving in style. Of course, nothing but the best. The best indeed. On the ride, Abby's nerves seemed to dissipate as they talked. Stuart tried to act as if this event were just a regular, everyday party, but he knew that for her it was anything but. When the limo pulled up to the building, the driver got out and came around to open the door. You ready? Stuart asked, offering her his hand. Abby seemed to hesitate. He didn't know if she was nervous about entering the party, which was outside of her comfort zone, or about taking his hand. Either way, she smiled and said, ready as I'll ever be, and placed her hand in his. They stepped from the limo and Stuart tucked her hand around his arm and confidently strode towards the door with her by his side. Just before they walked in, he leaned his mouth close to her ear and whispered, just remember one thing tonight. I think you're the most beautiful woman in the room. As they stepped through the door, Stuart knew they also stepped over a line, the one where they went from being boss and assistant and hopefully friends to something very different. He led Abby to the coat check where they dropped off their coats and he got a chance to admire her dress again. They began moving around the room and Stuart got them both a drink. Several men approached and shook hands with him and made small talk about business. Abby looked around the room at the red and green decorations. Garlands hung on the banisters of the wide staircase that was open to the second floor. Twinkling lights hung from the ceilings and draped the top of the walls, and the center of the room held a tall Christmas tree. It must have been 30 feet tall. It was covered in twinkling lights and ornaments. There was a spacious dance floor, and soft instrumental Christmas music was playing. The round tables were clad with white tablecloths, and the centerpieces were tall candles surrounded by wreaths made of greenery and mistletoe. That seemed appropriate for the mistletoe ball. Stuart led Abby around the room, making appropriate greetings to certain attendees. The room was so full of people, navigating wasn't easy, but Stuart was glad for a good turnout for the charity. He led them around the room and found his way to their table. The table card proudly displayed, One Source Technologies, Diamond Sponsor. He turned to Abby. Do you want to sit first or get food? Abby shrugged. Whatever you want. He knew she was being polite. Let's get some food and then we can sit and talk. You mean in between visits from your fans? Abby gave him a teasing smile. Stuart rolled his eyes. Yes, well, that is kind of part of the job. Abby put her hand on his arm. It's all right, I understand. Stuart put his hand over hers and then took it in his as they walked toward the food table. When they returned with plates of delicious-looking food, a photographer making the rounds was nearby and asked them for a photo. They sat down their plates, and Stuart tucked Abby in by his side before smiling for the picture. They made small talk as they ate. Abby made comments about the decorations and said they gave her some ideas for the office. Stuart chuckled. I was afraid of that. You spend so much time in your office, it should be more decorated than your house. How do you know how my house is decorated? Well, I guess I don't, Abby said. Would you like to see it? Is it decorated more than the office? Stuart shifted his eyes, not wanting to admit the truth. Well, yes, it is. Then yes, I would like to see it. All right, we'll make that happen. When they were finished eating, Stuart noticed that the dance floor was filling up. Would you like to dance? He asked. Sure. Abby stood and followed him. Stuart took Abby in his arms and they began to sway back and forth to the instrumental version of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. They heard the sound of a bell ringing and Abby looked around to see what was going on. What's that about? She asked quietly. It's a tradition of the mistletoe ball. They walk around and stop at a couple and ring the bell over their heads. It's just for fun, but when they ring the bell, it's an opportunity to make a donation to the hospital. Stuart left out a not-so-minor detail of the tradition. It wasn't long before the bell ringers made their way to the dance floor. As a couple had the bell rung over their head, they would often place money into the large basket carried by the bell ringer. Then the bell ringer would hand the man a piece of mistletoe, which he would hold over the woman's head, and then they would kiss. Stuart watched as Abby noticed this for the first time, and she smiled. Ah, she said. Then her eyes flew open wide as she realized what was happening. 
Before she could say anything else, the bell ringers approached them. Abby froze as the bell sounded over their heads. Stuart reached into his pocket and took out an envelope containing a sum of cash and placed it in the basket. When they handed him a bunch of mistletoe, he turned to Abby and saw how her face was strained. He didn't want her distress. He put his hands on her shoulders and quickly kissed her forehead. He could feel her relax, and he smiled at her. Boo, came a soft call from an older couple nearby. That's a waste of mistletoe, the woman chided them. Yes, boo, another couple joined in. Stuart looked around and then down at Abby, who was pink all over but laughing. I'm afraid we might have to give them what they want, he said. Abby smiled softly at him. I guess so. She looked in his eyes and nodded. Stuart relished the moment. He pulled her close into his arms and leaned down and pressed his lips to hers. He felt warmth spread from his lips to his toes. He leaned back and those around them cheered. He smiled at Abby and placed his nose on hers for a brief moment. He saw that her eyes were bright and she seemed a little breathless. As the bell ringers moved on to other couples, he pulled her close to him again and she put her head on his shoulder. Stuart's heart pounded and he just knew Abby could feel it. With her hand in his and the feel of her against him, he decided this was the best Christmas event he had ever attended. Chapter 11 Abby felt like she was floating, absolutely floating. She let Stuart hold her close on the dance floor and she enjoyed every minute of it. When they tired out on the dance floor, they went back to their table and enjoyed a cup of apple cider together. As she sipped her cider, Abby couldn't stop thinking about Stuart's lips on hers. It was brief, and he didn't pressure her, but she could still feel her lips tingling. She told herself to stop, but she kept wondering what it would be like to kiss him for real, and without an audience. While Stuart went to make more rounds, shaking hands and greeting people, Abby went to freshen her lipstick in the ladies' room. She walked towards the hall, but before she disappeared, she turned back, trying to catch a glimpse of Stuart. She expected to see him in his element, chatting. She did see him talking to a couple of men, but she caught him with his face and eyes turned watching her. When he saw her look his way, he winked at her before turning his attention back to the men. Abby felt herself blushing all the way down the hallway. She stepped inside the ladies' room and let out a big exhale. She pressed her palm to her chest, feeling her heart beat. What is happening? She wondered to herself. The night had felt magical, and she didn't think she would come down from this high for a long time. When she caught her breath, she hurried to the mirror and checked her hair before reapplying lipstick. She saw herself in the mirror, and while she knew the dress, hair, and makeup were working for her, she noticed something else. Her eyes. They looked different. She got closer to the mirror and stared at her own eyes. What is that? She thought. Then it hit her. She looked happy, more than happy, blissfully happy. It made her giggle, and she let herself enjoy that for a moment before she composed herself. She wanted to rush back out and see Stuart. She exited the bathroom and glanced down at the floor as she hurried down the hall. Just before she rounded the corner, she looked up and nearly ran into the man she was looking for. Oh, hey, she said, her hands landing on his chest to stop herself. Hey, Stuart's voice was low. I thought you were still out there. I didn't want to wait any longer to see you again. Abby blushed again. I was only gone for a few minutes. I know. Stuart moved closer and put his hands on her waist. Abby stepped backward in the quiet hallway. Is this really happening? She wondered as she slipped her arms around his neck and whispered, What did you not want to wait any longer for? She backed up against the wall when she could go no further. This. Stuart got the word out just before their lips met. The mistletoe kiss had nothing on this one. He leaned in and kissed her gently. She reached her hands up to the back of his head and ran her fingers through his hair. His hands came up to cradle her face. Each kiss lasted a little longer than the one before. When Stuart leaned back, they were both breathless. Abby's face was pink from blushing and excitement. Stuart kissed her one last time on her nose before he leaned close to say, Are you ready to leave? Are you? Do you need to stay longer? Nah, 
I've made the rounds been seen, and I think the photographer has taken at least 30 pictures, so we're good. All right. Abby didn't want to admit that she was feeling disappointed and didn't want the evening to end. Stuart seemed to read her mind. I don't have to take you home yet. I thought maybe we could get some warm drinks and drive around to look at Christmas lights. Abby's face lit up. You did? Stuart flashed her that adorable grin of his. I did. Well, then let's go. Let's go, Stuart repeated, slipping her hand into his and leading her through the ballroom. Back in the limo, Stuart picked up the mugs of hot cocoa that he had sent Patrick for. Abby was shocked. You planned this? Her mouth fell open in surprise. Oh, I hoped for it, Stuart said. Abby still couldn't believe this. She wanted to pinch herself to see if this was real, but she knew it had to be since she couldn't have even imagined anything like this. Stuart had already given instructions to Patrick, and he drove them outside of the city into some quiet neighborhoods, and they drove around for over an hour looking at Christmas lights. Abby and Stuart snuggled close, looking out the windows and pointing to their favorite decorations. They stopped for a while at a house where the family had set up an elaborate display set to music. As the final song played, Abby clapped and cheered. Stuart pulled her close and gave her a quick kiss. Now where to? Abby asked. It's getting pretty late, and I know you have to work tomorrow, he said with a wink. Oh, you're right, I do. And you should know, my boss is pretty demanding. I've heard that about him. Well, you heard right, Abby giggled. Stuart poked her ribs while she giggled more until they were both laughing and she fell into his arms where he kissed her again. When they came up for air, Abby was the first to speak. I guess I really should be getting home. You're probably right. He pushed the intercom button and asked the driver to take them to Abby's apartment. They held hands and talked the entire way back to the apartment. Abby was yawning by the time they pulled up, but she tried to cover it in hopes that they could talk a while longer. Stuart twirled one of her curls with his finger and spoke gently. You're tired. You should get some rest. Are you trying to get rid of me? She asked through another yawn. Never, he whispered, leaning down to kiss her again. But I want you to have what you need, and what you need now is sleep. Mm-hmm, Abby replied dreamily. Come on, I'll walk you to the door, Stuart said, opening the door and stepping out. He took her hand as they walked the steps together and stopped outside of her door. Abby found her keys and fumbled with them in her hands, trying to think of what to say to express what the evening had meant. Stuart, tonight was... Yes, he said, coming close. It was better than I could have imagined, she said. I will always remember the evening under the mistletoe. She smiled. Stuart smiled too. I'll never forget it, he said. He kissed her once more before he quietly said, Good night, Abby. Good night, Stuart. While he turned to go, she opened the door and entered her apartment. She dropped her keys and walked to her bedroom. She let herself fall under her bed, coat, dress, and all. She knew she would lay awake for a while, replaying every moment of the night. But she wanted to pinch herself because tomorrow morning she would still get up and go to work with the sweetest, most handsome man she had ever known. Chapter 12 Stuart was still smiling from the night before. He had slept like a rock and woken up before his alarm. He was usually up early and ready to get to work, but he knew this time it had more to do with the woman who would be in his office today. He showered and dressed in record time and arrived at the office earlier than normal, which he knew was a little silly since Abby wouldn't be in for a while. Still, he got to work on emails and looking over some of the project proposals that he had chosen to make the cut for the next round. He had a voicemail from the company publicist asking Stuart to please call him. Stuart picked up his phone and dialed the number, thinking that it was probably something to do with photos from last night. The press liked to hear details, and he was expecting calls about the lovely woman on his arm. Hi, Mr. Vincent. Thanks for calling so quickly. No problem. What's up, Evan? I've had a call from a reporter. Yes? Stuart prepared himself to answer questions about Abby. He knew he wanted to protect her from any bad headlines or reporters looking into her personal life. He hit the speakerphone button, but he wasn't prepared for what he heard next. 
He says he got a call from a grocery store clerk who says you bought groceries for a woman and offered to help her find a job. Oh, was all Stuart could say. He wants to run a story on it. You know, rich businessman helps woman in need. I want to find out the details of what happened and see if it's something we want to let happen. If it's true, it could be good publicity for the company, especially around the holidays. Everybody loves a good Samaritan. I can pretty much guarantee that if we let them run this story, people will be buying up one-source computers and tablets to put under their trees. I'm sure you knew that even before you did it. Right, right, Stuart said slowly. So is it true? Yes, it's true. Abby had walked into the office with a smile on her face. She carried two coffees and bounced right over to Stuart's office door. It was open and she was about to walk right in when she heard him talking on the phone. She hadn't meant to eavesdrop, but she had quietly stood and listened and her mouth fell open as she heard the publicist speak. When she heard Stuart confirm the story, she walked away in disgust. She practically dropped the coffee on her desk and plopped down in her chair. He would do all of that for publicity? I guess it's a small price to pay, a couple of hundred dollars for free marketing and everyone falling for a company owner and his products, just in time for Christmas shopping. Suddenly, it all made perfect sense, but she didn't want to believe it. She had stood in awe of him when he helped that woman. Now she wasn't so sure. Great, so I'll just get a few quotes from you. Has the woman called the office? It would be great if we could connect her to the reporter from the story. No, Stuart said firmly. All right, well, we'll see if we can help find her. I mean, no, we're not doing the story, Stuart said. What? The publicist's voice showed his shock. But it could be very profitable for the company. I'm well aware of that, but I did not do it for publicity, and I will not publicize that woman who is going through a hard time. That is cruel, and my decision is final. The voice on the other line huffed, but he knew better than to question the word of the company owner. Yes, sir, he said. Abby was fuming, but decided she would hear out the conversation. As she approached, she could hear that Stuart's tone had changed as if he had moved on to a new topic. Evan, he said, who do you know in publishing for fiction books? Plenty of people, sir. I know several editors and a few managing directors at some of the big houses. Abby furrowed her eyebrows, wondering where he was going with this. Could you connect me with a good fit for a new author in the romance genre? Of course. Who is the author, may I ask? Sure, it's my... He paused for a moment and finally said, Assistant. And she's a romance author? Yes, I would like to help her get her work in front of an editor or publisher. All right, is she any good? Well, I haven't read any of her work but I will be willing to do what it takes to help her get her work in front of the right people. Yes, sir, I understand. I'll make some calls and get back to you. Thank you, Evan. Abby had heard enough. Once again, she stormed to her desk. She started to sit, but couldn't make herself stay still. She paced back and forth in the office. She glanced over at the Christmas tree lit up and glowing. Stuart must have plugged it in when he got there. The sight of it made her want to pull off the ornaments and throw them. I can't believe I fell for such a fake. I can't believe I believed him when he pretended to believe in me as a writer. He just wants to wave his money around and pay someone to publish my work. She stopped pacing when she heard footsteps coming from Stuart's office. Good morning, he said, smiling at her. That smile made her stomach turn. He came to her but stopped just short of reaching out for her. How are you? Fine, Abby lied. Did you get some good sleep? Yes. That part wasn't a lie. She had slept like a baby and dreamed wonderful dreams all night. I'm glad, he said. So what do you need me to do this morning? Abby asked, her voice sounding cold. Stuart seemed surprised by her tone. I have a couple of meetings, and there are still a few project proposals to go over before Christmas. I know that's only a week away, so I would like to get them done as quickly as possible. Of course, after Christmas, we need to sit down and evaluate your work performance and make a decision about continuing your employment. He smiled as if he had made a joke. Yes, I'm aware of that. I need to check email, so I'll look over your schedule to make sure I'm on top of it. Stuart gave her a strange look. All right, I'll just be in my office then. All right, Abby said without looking at him, but she saw out of the corner of her eye how he walked back to his office slowly. She blew out a big breath.
She knew she would have to say something eventually, but not now. She still needed this job, and she had worked hard to keep it, so she decided to move forward, pretending last night didn't happen, and just focus on her job. She felt like maybe she could cry, but right now she was too angry for that. Stewart sat in his office staring out the window. He knew he should have been working, but all he could think about was how Abby had spoken to him. She hadn't smiled once, and she had been so short with him. He had been over the night before, over and over again in his mind. He had thought the night had been wonderful, but then thought about how Abby was acting this morning. He didn't know what he had done wrong. He wanted to go out to her desk right now and ask her so he could fix it. But he stopped himself. He shook his head, decided there was nothing to do about it right now. He glanced over at his phone when he heard it beep. A text from Abby reminded him of his video call starting in ten minutes. He hoped she might add a personal message, but none came. He settled in and readied himself for the meeting. Doubts began to creep in, reminding him why he stayed out of relationships in the first place. When he finished his video call, Stuart stepped out of the office and saw Abby sitting at her desk, focused on her computer screen. Hey, he said. Hey, Abby said, but didn't turn to look at him. I know it's almost lunchtime. Do you want to order something to eat and we can look over projects? Sure, I can handle that. Anything special you would like to eat, Mr. Vincent? Stuart felt like she had stabbed him in the chest as she punctuated his last name. He took a deep breath before saying, whatever you would like. Abby let out an exasperated sigh. I can order anything, but it's not my decision to make. Fine, I'll have the chicken euros from the Greek restaurant. Yes, sir, I'll have it delivered as soon as possible. There was no missing her formal tone, and Stuart was flabbergasted. He walked back to his office, but instead of sitting at his desk, he collapsed on the couch. He dropped his face in his hands and fought with himself on the inside. He had let himself fall for her, and now she wouldn't look at him. What have I done? He asked himself. He thought and thought of everything he had said and done. Suddenly, it hit him like a rock. Of course. She's afraid she will lose her job. She's trying to be professional. The thought gave him a little bit of peace. This he could fix. He decided when she brought in the lunch he would clear the air and put her at ease. He breathed a little easier. It was nearly half an hour before Abby knocked on his door. He stood and went to her as she brought in his lunch. Thank you, he said. You're welcome. Abby still didn't look him in the eye and turned to leave the office. Are you bringing in your lunch? he asked. I wasn't planning to. I thought we were going to work on proposals over lunch. Is that what you want to do? Finally, she turned and looked at him, and he could see the stress on her face. Abby, please come in and shut the door. She looked like she wanted to do anything besides that, but she did as she was asked. Stuart took a seat on the couch and motioned for her to follow him. Reluctantly, she did and sat on the opposite end of the couch. Abby, I know you're feeling uncomfortable with the situation, but I don't want you to worry about your job. Stuart spoke calmly and carefully. Abby narrowed her eyes at him. So you know what I'm feeling. Stuart hesitated, seeing her eyes flash with anger. Well, I thought so, but maybe you should tell me. No, Abby practically yelled. Please tell me more about what I'm feeling. I just thought you were maybe feeling concerned about your position here after last night. But I don't want you to worry about that. And why is that? You're just going to give me money? Stuart's face showed his shock. No, I didn't mean that at all. I just mean that you can keep your job. Well, thank you very much for that. Her voice dripped with sarcasm. Would you be more comfortable working in a different office? Stuart was grasping at straws. No, I'm fine. I just think it's best if we both focus on our jobs. But Abby, Stuart began. She held up her hands to him. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's just get to the projects and do the work that we're here to do. I know that's the most important thing. He wanted to argue with her to tell her that she was important and that he would do whatever he could to make her happy. But he didn't push her, especially since she was only saying what he had been telling himself for so many years. Chapter 13 
The past few days had been long and hard. Abby was tired from the stress. She had been to work every day and had mostly managed to do her job without interacting with Stuart on a personal level. She was hurt in a way she didn't know she could be. Her parents had pushed her to find a real job, but through that she thought she had finally met someone who believed she could make it as a writer. The worst part was knowing that he had never looked at a word she had written, but assumed she would need his help to make it as a writer. She couldn't look at him the same after that, and she watched the news to see what the story about his wonderful charitable giving would do for the company. It made her sick. She should have known better than to fall for her boss. She had told herself that over and over again, but now she knew her days at the office were probably limited. After the holiday, she was certain that he would let her go. Until then, she just had to keep doing her job. Abby looked up when a man she didn't recognize walked into her office. Hi, can I help you? She asked. I'm Evan Briggs. I'm the company publicity director. Oh, hi, I'm Abby Williams, Mr. Vincent's assistant. At least for now, she thought. Nice to meet you. I have some information Mr. Vincent asked me for. Is he available? He's in, but let me see if he's busy. One moment, please. Abby stepped to the door and knocked. She stepped inside and told Stuart who was there, and Stuart seemed eager to speak to him. Abby quickly stepped out and said, you can go in. She returned to her desk as the man entered the office and shut the door. Several minutes later, he emerged from the office and headed for the door. He turned back to say, nice to meet you, Abby. Have a nice day. You too, Abby said, plastering on the same fake smile she had been using for days. Stuart stepped out and said he was leaving for a little while. Abby waved her hand at him but didn't speak. The tension had been high for days and now the air in the office felt thick. Abby? Yes, Mr. Vincent? Stuart winced. Abby knew the name grated on his nerves when she said it, and maybe that's why she kept doing it, even though she told herself she was just being professional. We need to talk. Here it comes, Abby thought. All right, she said. She closed her computer and folded her hands into her lap. Stuart walked to her desk and stood in front of her. I don't know how to fix this, he pointed between the two of them but I want to. Okay, Abby said coolly. So tell me how. There's nothing wrong, Abby lied. Come on, Abby, that's not true and you know it. I'm just trying to do my job, you know, trying to keep it professional. Is that what this is about? You just want to be professional? I think professional is best. Stuart sighed. Do you think we'll ever get back to where we were? What do you mean? You know what I mean, Abby. We were getting close. I just don't think that's a good idea. I thought maybe it could work, but I just don't think we really knew each other that well, and I think we need to just go back to being boss and employee. So you don't like me anymore? Stuart asked boldly. I don't have to like you to work for you. Abby could see that that wounded him. Abby, please tell me what I did. You didn't do anything. You're just you, and I'm just me, and I don't think that works. Stuart glanced at his watch. I have to get to my meeting. Can we talk about this more later? I really don't think there's anything to talk about. I think there is. Well, I don't. Abby looked at him and her eyes showed her anger. Fine. Stuart turned to go. But Abby's voice stopped him in his tracks and he turned to look at her. I know you plan to work on Christmas Eve, she cleared her throat. But I want to be off on Christmas Eve. Stuart dropped his head. When he looked up, his eyes were sad, and Abby almost wanted to go to him. Almost. Abby, he said slowly, feel free to take off the entire day on Christmas Eve. You have served as a good assistant. I'll pay you for the rest of the time through Christmas, but I think it's best if today is your last day. Abby sucked in her breath. She knew it didn't matter much, since he would let her go after the holidays, but she knew she had pushed him to it. Goodbye, Abby. Have a nice Christmas. Chapter 14 Stuart laid on his couch, staring up at the high ceilings. He didn't want to be here in his house, but he also didn't want to go to the office. That's a first, he thought to himself. Most people look forward to holidays or vacations and dread going to work, but I've spent my whole career loving what I do and missing work when I'm away. He sighed. Nothing feels right. 
This morning, he had a pit in his stomach, just like every day since Abby had left. He wanted to call her, text her, see her, but he was afraid all he would get was more hurt. This had never been the plan. Sure, when he first hired her, he thought he would probably make it work until the first of the year, and maybe nothing more, but he didn't know how she was going to come into his life and change everything. The night of the mistletoe ball, he had so many thoughts and made a million plans in his mind. While they drove around looking at Christmas lights, he dreamed of making it a tradition every year, and he made plans to let her help decorate his house in the future. He had thought about spending Christmas Day together and about kissing her at midnight on New Year's Eve. He squeezed his eyes closed now, trying to push away all the could-have-been thoughts. He had wanted to be a man she could trust and someone she could share her dreams with, but now she was gone. Stuart gathered himself and got ready for work. He drug himself into the office, the cold and the snow now seeming less magical and more miserable. He walked in thinking he needed some coffee. Since he was so much later than normal getting in, his assistant was already at her desk. Mallory was from the temp agency, a recent college graduate who wasn't sure what she wanted to do with her life. Good morning, Mr. Vincent, she said cheerily. Morning, he growled. He thought about asking her to get coffee, but the last time he did, she had been gone for an hour and came back with his order all wrong. He knew he would have to go through a real hiring process soon, but he couldn't make himself do that yet. That's why I hired Abby, he thought. Stewart opened the door to his office and stood staring into the room. Is there anything I can do for you this morning? Mallory asked. Where did you put the files that were on my desk? Oh, <laughs> Mallory giggled like a high school girl. Surprise! I cleaned up the office for you. I stacked all of the paperwork and put them over there on the shelf. Stuart let out a huff. He made it a policy not to speak rudely to employees, but now he was pretty close. Mallory, I had those where I wanted them, he said through clenched teeth. Please, don't touch any paperwork in my office. Yes, sir. Mallory said quietly and went back to her desk. Stuart entered the office and made his way to the stack of file folders. They had been sorted into piles on his desk, but now he could see they were all mixed together. He rubbed his hand across his face, the three-day-old stubble scraping his hand. I'll spend all day fixing this, he said out loud. Better get to it. As he looked at folder after folder, he kept telling himself he wished Abby was still his assistant. She would never have made this mess, he thought. Somewhere around the seventh folder, he realized that wasn't true. He didn't want a better assistant. He didn't want Abby back as his assistant. He just wanted Abby. Abby stared at her computer screen. She may have had a rough week, but for now she had what she had wanted for so long, enough money in her bank account to pay all her bills, and time to sit and write. So why can't I do it? she asked herself. She sat in a back booth in the same coffee shop where she had met Stuart weeks earlier. She had her coffee beside her and her laptop on full charge, ready to spend the day writing. But as she held her fingers over the keyboard, nothing would come. She had always been able to dive right into her stories, and all day long her mind worked on characters and ideas. Now it all seemed impossible. She slammed her laptop shut and let her face fall in her hands. I don't know if I can write romance anymore when I know it's all a lie. Men are fake, they're all the same fake, and all they care about is money. Making money, having money, using money to get what they want. Abby wished it wasn't true, but she had seen it for herself enough times. She sighed a heavy sigh. If it's all fake anyway, I guess I might as well write some good fake stories. She opened her computer again and forced herself to type one sentence and then another, and another. It felt dry, but she was glad to get some words on the page. She was beginning to get into the flow when she heard someone say her name. Abby? The male voice said. She looked up and furrowed her eyebrows at the man she didn't recognize. Yes, she said, sounding as if it were a question. I'm sorry, you probably don't remember me. I'm Evan Briggs. I work at One Source. Oh, yes, that's right. You're the publicity director, right? Yes, that's right. He glanced around. Do you mind if I sit? Um, no, Abby said, feeling uncertain. I guess not. 
I'm just waiting for my coffee so I won't keep you long. Abby shut her laptop. She was always very protective against people seeing her writing. So are you a writer? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm trying. She remembered his voice on the phone with Stuart. That's right. Stu M Mr. Vincent talked to you about me. Well, yes, sort of. He didn't tell me anything about your work. He just wanted me to connect you with some people in the industry. He must really think you're good to offer to do that. Oh, really? Abby raised one eyebrow, ready to tell him that she would beg to differ. Absolutely. I've worked with Mr. Vincent for a few years now, and that's long enough for me to know that he would never recommend something to someone unless he believes in it 110%. Oh? Abby said again. That's interesting, though, since he's never read any of my work. Evan laughed. I can imagine that romance novels aren't exactly his thing, but that's why he wanted to connect you with an editor, someone who will look at your work and give you an honest opinion and some pointers. But I've heard Mr. Vincent say a thousand times that he believes in people, and it's not just about if someone is gifted or talented. It's about their desire to work for what they want. And I'm guessing he thought you were someone who had the drive to accomplish your goals. Oh, Abby said quietly. They called his name then, and Evan stood. Well, my coffee's ready. It was nice to see you again. Abby stopped him. Just out of curiosity, did you find the woman from the grocery store? Evan lowered his eyebrows. Beg your pardon? You know, the woman from the grocery store. Did you find her to talk to the press about the story? How do you know about that? Abby shrugged. I just know. Did the woman call the office? No, I never heard from her. Well, I didn't look for her. Why not? Don't you know? Evan seemed confused. Know what? Evan put his hands on the back of the chair and leaned over. Abby, I asked Mr. Vincent to do the story. I thought it would be great publicity for the company. Yeah, I know, Abby mumbled. But Mr. Vincent said no. What? Abby's eyes flew open wide. He didn't want anyone to know about that. He said he didn't do it for publicity, and he didn't want to embarrass the woman to have her face on the news. Evan shrugged. I thought it was a good idea, but I don't argue with Mr. Vincent. Oh. Abby repeated herself for the fourth time. She felt sick to her stomach all of the sudden. I've got to run. Have a nice day. Evan turned to get his coffee and was gone. Abby let her face fall into her hands and took several deep breaths. Stupid, 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 she said to herself. Why was I so stupid? He'll never even talk to me now. Oh, what did I do? She berated herself for several minutes before she realized a tear was sliding down her cheek. She had been stupid and stubborn, and it probably cost her the kindest man she had ever met. Suddenly, she sat up straight and froze in her spot. But I have to find out, she told herself. She looked at her watch and then gathered up her things, shoving them in her bag as fast as she could. She stopped at the counter and made a quick order. Then just like the day she met Stuart, she took off as fast as she could, walking the two blocks to the office building. Chapter 15 Stuart sat on the couch in his office, file folders and papers spread across the table and the floor all around him. He looked up when he heard his assistant's voice getting louder and louder. You can't just go in his office, she squeaked. It's all right. I'm sure it will be all right. Stuart's heart thudded and he froze in place when he recognized the other female voice. He stood to go to the door, but his feet wouldn't move. When the door opened and Abby walked through, he thought his heart would burst at the sight. Mallory was close behind trying to stop her. Abby met his gaze and they locked eyes. Her look seemed to plead with him to let her in. Mallory, it's fine. She is welcome to come in. Abby let out a breath, seeming relieved. Mallory left, closing the door behind her. Stuart finally made a move and went to Abby. He reached his hands out when he saw that she held two coffees. For me? He asked. Yes, Abby practically whispered. It's a peace offering. Thank goodness. I haven't had good coffee since you've been gone. He watched Abby's face as she turned her eyes to the piles in the floor behind him. What in the world? Her eyes showed her shock. Yeah, Stuart rubbed his forehead. The temporary assistant decided to clean up my desk. She mixed all the projects up and I can't figure it all out. Oh, no. 
Abby seemed genuinely concerned. Do you want me to help you? I remember most of the ones we picked for the next round. Stuart reached out and put his hand on her arm. That's all right. I'm sure you didn't come here to help me sort papers. He flinched. Or did you? Are you here to ask for your job back? He hoped that wasn't the reason. Um, no, not exactly. But maybe. Abby bit her lip and he could see she was nervous. Come here. Stuart led her to the couch and moved a pile of folders to the table. When they were both seated, he turned to her, fighting the urge to pull her into his arms. What did you come here for? He asked gently. Abby took a deep breath and let it out. Stuart, I know I was horrible the last few days I was here. I wish I could take it back, but I was so upset. About what? I thought it was because you were worried our personal life was moving quickly and you were trying to be professional, but I know it was more than that. I'm sorry. I should have talked to you, but the morning after the mistletoe ball, she paused. Well, I heard you on the phone, and I heard the publicist say the news wanted to do a story about the woman that you helped with groceries. I was so mad, like fuming mad. Abby held her hands wide with her fingers spread apart to show the extent of her anger. I had thought you were this wonderful guy who not only was fun and kind and smart, but also wanted to help out a total stranger by feeding her kids. So to hear that you knew it would be a good news story and that it would benefit the company just floored me. Stuart waited until she stopped to say, but I didn't let them do the story. Well, I know that now. Abby's voice was quiet but I didn't then, and it just completely knocked you down from where I had built you up in my mind. Tell me more about how you had built me up. Stuart's voice was teasing. She punched him playfully in the arm, but before she could pull back, he took her hand in his. I'm sorry I ever gave you a reason to doubt. I'm sorry I didn't talk to you about it. It's all my fault. But now you know, right? Yes, Abby said, but there's something else. That was only part of why I was mad, and maybe if it had just been that, I would have told you what I thought, and we could have worked it out. But I also know you told Evan you would do whatever you could to get my writing in front of the right people. Stuart sat still and stared at her. Well, that part is true. I did say that, and I will. But I don't understand the problem with that. The problem is that writing is my thing. I want my writing to be good and I wanted you to believe that I could do it without you cashing in favors to the right people. Abby! Stuart raised his voice in shock. Do you think I would trade favors or pay people to publish your work? If I wanted to do that, I could start my own publishing company and publish your book no matter how bad it is. But I would never do that. I have seen how hard you've worked at being my assistant. You stepped up from day one and took charge of the position— because of that, I know you will give your writing your best effort, and you won't stop until it's the best it can be. And only then would I help connect you with editors that can look it over and help you get it ready for publication. Abby hung her head. Yeah, I know that now, too. Stuart lifted her chin with his finger until she looked him in the eyes. Abby, I want you to know this. I believe in you. I believe in you as a person, as a hard worker, and as a dreamer, and I know that you will not only accomplish but thrive in whatever you want to do. Abby smiled as a blush crept over her face. So can you forgive me for being stupid and ridiculous? Hmm, I guess so, on one condition. What's that? Let me show you something. Wait here. Stuart stood and went to his desk. From the bottom drawer, he pulled out a white box and brought it to the couch. I had this sent over after the ball, but I never got a chance to give it to you. So my condition is that you help me put up this last bit of Christmas decorations in the office. He placed the box in Abby's lap and sat back to watch her open it. She gave him a questioning look, but she slowly untied the bright red ribbon and lifted off the lid of the box. She sucked in a breath and put her hand to her mouth when she saw the contents. She grinned at Stuart before she lifted out a bunch of mistletoe tied with a ribbon. Abby laughed. You sure you want to hang this in the office? Hmm, maybe I'll just keep it in my desk. He winked at her. But let me see it. I've worked in this business my entire career, and I've made that my life. But you walked right into my office carrying coffee in your hands and Christmas in your back pocket. 
You flipped every idea I had about what my future would look like and made me want things I've never wanted before. And Abby, what I want is you. I want to know life outside of work with you, and I want us to have a future that we figure out together. Stuart stopped and waited for her to respond. Abby tilted her head towards him, and her smile went from ear to ear. Sounds good to me. I love you, Abby. I love you too, Stuart. Then he slowly raised the mistletoe over their heads and lowered his lips to hers. He knew they didn't need the mistletoe anymore and dropped it on the couch to take her in his arms. Epilogue Ten, nine, eight. Abby loudly cheered each number, counting down the seconds. Stuart had surprised her just that day, telling her to pack a bag and they were going to New York City to see the ball drop. She looked down at his hands on hers and felt warm from her nose to her toes. Despite the freezing temperatures and the threat of snow, she looked up in Stuart's eyes and she just knew. She knew that this was the first of all the New Year's together that they would have together for the rest of their lives. Stuart was still counting. Seven, six, five when Abby reached up and took his face in her hands and kissed him. Hey, he said, we're supposed to count down to zero. Abby laughed. I didn't want to wait any longer. Stuart smiled at her and nuzzled her cold nose against his. Me either. He kissed her again. The crowd cheered as they looked up to watch the ball drop and the noise was deafening. The air filled with streamers and the sky above lit up with fireworks. Stuart yelled to be heard, but it was too loud, so he pulled Abby's hand and led her away from the crowd. When they were far enough to hear each other, but still able to see the celebration, he stopped and turned Abby to face him. Abby, I don't want to wait either. She gave him a confused look before he continued. When my assistant walked out on me, I didn't know how I would survive the holiday season. Then you walked in, and everything just seemed to work. I didn't know how great it would be, I only knew that I didn't want to look for an assistant. I told you I could do the job. Abby could feel her heart pounding, even though she tried to joke. Yes, you did. And you did it so well, which makes it hard for me to say what I'm about to say. Abby felt concern rising in her, but tried to focus on his words. Abby, we said we would give it a trial run with you as my assistant and that we would decide after New Year's. Yes, Abby said cautiously. So now it's after the first of the year, and regrettably, I'm going to have to fire you. What? Abby practically shouted. I know, I know you're feeling upset. Stuart held up his hands, but it's just not going to work out. And why not? Because being an assistant is not the dream you have for your life. You want to be a writer, and I believe you are going to do that and have a wonderful full-time career as a writer. But in order to do that, you can't be my assistant anymore. Abby stood with her mouth hanging open. Of course she wanted to be a writer, but she still couldn't pay her bills with writing right now. But Stuart, she began. Stuart held up his hands to stop her. There's more. I know you worry about your finances and making it as a writer. While I think you will be successful and you won't have to worry about that, I also need to fire you for another reason. Abby, you have changed my life. I'm a different man a better man because I met you and because of the light you've brought into my life. I don't think you will have time to be my assistant anymore because I hope you will be busy planning the best wedding I've ever been to. At that moment, he dropped down on his knee and pulled out a small black box. He opened it to reveal a sparkling diamond that must have been custom designed for her. Abby Williams, will you marry me? Abby felt like she had run through every emotion possible in the last two minutes, but this feeling of happiness was her favorite. She didn't waste any time before yelling out, Yes! Yes, I will! Stuart stood and placed the ring on her finger before taking her in his arms and kissing her. The sound of fireworks echoed over them as they celebrated together. One last thing. Stuart touched his nose to Abby's as they stood close. What's that? Abby smiled. Will you still bring me coffee? Abby threw her head back and laughed. Yes, sir, Mr. Vincent. Every single day.
This has been Billionaire Under the Mistletoe, Billionaire for Christmas Book One, written by Hannah Jo Abbott, narrated by Emily Christine, copyright 2019 by Hannah Jo Abbott, production copyright by Hannah Jo Abbott.